Okay, you can start now. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third interview workshop. My name is Iman Hamid. I'm the academic office leader of VSAP CH. On behalf of my team, we would like to welcome you all and we would like to wish you best of luck on your upcoming interviews. Today is day one. We will have day two, which is the practical mock interviews next week on the 21st of January. So be mindful of that. Today, we will have five talks delivered by five distinguished speakers. Just a general housekeeping rules, please make sure that your cameras and your mics are muted to minimize disturbances to our speakers. Now, without a further delay, let me ask Rauda, our moderator of the day, to present our first speaker. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rhoda. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Naveen Arthman. Uh, he is a neonatologist at the Royal Victoria Infirmity, Newcastle upon Tyne. He was a program director at School of Pediatrics, Nohdirani, from February 2018 until August 2022. And he uh, is a panel member at the National Pediatric Rec Recruitment. So, welcome, Dr. Naveen. Thanks, thanks, Rada. Um, I'm, I'm Naveen. Um, I think we have 50 minutes, isn't it, um, to go through this. Um, might be we can go through quicker, uh, slower. Um, but so the aim of today um, is to just to think a little bit together um, uh, about what we expect when we sit as a panel member for a clinical thinking station. Um, and, and, and what are the uh, basics which, um, which is probably uh, quite important to, uh, to go through um, in every clinical thinking station. Um, and, and also a um, couple of uh, um, scenarios. I don't know if um, how many um, trainees or how many candidates are there. It will be useful if, if they can join in, but it's, it's fine. If not, I, I, can, I can just um, um, go through them um, should be should be fine. So the um, so clinical thinking station, as the name goes, the, the it's 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 actually a, um, a clinical assessment and management of a clinical problem. So it, this is one of the core interview stations. You will have other three. Um, one is communication, um, and um, I think there are a couple more. So communication, uh, clinical thinking, um, uh, career motivation, and. Um, can't on top of my head remember the four core. So this is one of the most important um, um, stations. It's worth uh, preparing for this. And the aim here is to assess the um, ability of any trainee or any candidate um, to assess and manage a clinical problem. So it's also remember um, at this point, so you are applying for either ST1 so if, or ST4. So ST1, we'll, we'll go through that in a minute. ST1, the expectation is slightly different to ST4. So, so, the, so what you shouldn't think is that you should know everything. You're not applying for a consultant post and, and he, 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 you, you need to um, be safe. That's the primary thing and think through <coughs> logically and, and, and um, seek help. That's, that's essentially the, the, the most important bits. <coughs> Excuse me. So you'll be given a verbal scenario. So the scenario is verbal, but it, actually you have it in, um, in a sheet and you will have it before you go into the uh, panel. Um, and at least uh, you will have a couple of minutes to read through the scenario and prepare. Um, and so you, you will have um, a thing, a prepare as in you'll be able to think about this. Um, and, and then once you're in, you'll have to progress through the scenario verbally. So you don't have any patience. It will be two panel members. So you'll have to go through with the assessor. Um, so it's important to remember this because um, candidates think, I know I know this, this is a sick child, um, um, so I'll have to manage this in your head. But it's useful to verbalize everything. It's like a driving test in, in, in England. Um, you have to uh, verbalize, it'll be useful, um, so that I know as an assessor um, that you think this child is sick. And, and, and it's, 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 that's, quite important. And most of the cases you will get will be either urgent or emergency cases in clinical thinking. So it, it might not always be emergency, but it can be emergency. But one other thing it's important you always think about is safeguarding in, in, in any case you get. 
So here you're assessed um, as a doctor in training at the level you're applying for. Um, and, and so the, the, there's a person specification uh, you would have received and it will clearly state what is expected of you when it comes to clinical thinking. And that is exactly what they, they want. And the marking framework will be um, based on that. So if you look at this for an ST1, um, so you, you can see uh, the primary aim. Um, so what you're looking for is ability to apply. So sound clinical knowledge and judgment. So they're expecting you to have an understanding of um, the, so the, the clinical condition and, and, and you're able to uh, put, apply your clinical knowledge and judgment um, based on what the, what the um, presentation is. So you need to be able to prioritize uh, clinical need and patient safety. That is absolute paramount. Um, and, and, and then um, you, uh, they're looking at whether you're, you've got the ability to um, seek for help. So if you, if you so, so when it comes to patient safety, seek for help, and also uh, you have the ability to start the basic management while your help is arriving, so essentially the initial management of the acutely ill patient. And they're also looking for aptitude for practical skills like manual dexterity, are you able to cannulate and, and, and are you able to do in, in, intraoceous needles if, if needed be, or, or if you are not able to, are you able to get the right help? Successful completion of training in pediatrics under neonatal life support. So it's, this is something which um, they're looking for. And, and, and also the demonstrable competencies of level two and three for, um, for pediatric safeguarding. So having some understanding of pediatric safeguarding within UK is useful um, for, for this interview, particularly when you explain, when you get a clinical thinking case which involves safeguarding, um, it, it will be extremely helpful. So, as, so it's, it's, if you look at the um, job description or, 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 or description, clinical description expect, expected for an ST3, ST4, is slightly, uh, it's similar but slightly um, at a higher level. You can see that the capacity, so the, here it's again, they're expecting you uh, to have uh, the ability to have um, a, a good understanding of the clinical problem, use um, your, your background knowledge and judgment and, and logical sense for, 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 to manage the situation. And you also have the potential um, to, to have it a good variable differential diagnosis so that you, you understand the problem and differential, make a differential diagnosis and initiate management. So they are looking at evidence of up-to-date and demonstrate advanced life support and safeguarding skills. So, and, and, and if, if it's an emergency, seek help. And, and, and if it's an urgent case, it might be you still um, want to seek help um, and, and um, and, and, and also the um, initiate the initial management of acutely ill patients. Here they're looking for aptitude of practical skills like hand-eye coordination, manual dexterity, which is quite similar. Um, but, but expectation for an ST1 or ST4 is that experience levels is high, the ability to do procedures is high, because most of the ST1s, um, they have not done pediatrics. So the, their expectation is more generic and the questions will be a bit more generic. But whereas, um, 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 for an ST3, ST4, uh, the expectation would be, um, are you able to do it? Means you, you are expected to do um, most of the things like simple procedural skills. And successful completion in, of training in pediatric and, and NLS, uh, neonatal life support, and also um, comp demonstrate competencies in, in level two and three pediatric safeguard. See, the, these are uh, some, some expectations. And this is what you're assessed for. So when it comes to clinical assessment and management, um, like we said, I think the first and foremost when it comes to clinical assessment is they are looking at whether you are a safe person. Patient safety is absolute paramount. So um, that, that you, you make sure that, that um, you say that out loud. And as, the, as your first point, patient safety is of absolute paramount. Um, and, and so they recognize that you do um, have a, an understanding of uh, an, an importance of the patient safety because you, you almost all of the trainees know that, um, and, but they don't verbalize and it's important to verbalize. Those words are, are quite, quite uh, important. And for the panel member, it's, it's useful to know that, that you have an understanding of patient safety. 
Um, and then able to perform initial assessment and stabilization of a sick child. Um, so this is um, what we discussed. We looked at the, um, in the previous slide and arrive at a differential diagnosis and know what further investigations management options may be appropriate. Awareness of current guidelines and evidence-based medicine. So, so if you're an ST1 and never worked in pediatrics, you might not have a huge awareness of current guidance and evidence-based medicine. Whereas in ST4 or ST2, ST3, ST4, you, you, if you've worked in the UK, you, you would have um, seen um, current guidance. Um, and, and, and if you've not worked in the UK, it's still useful to say that I would use local guidance um, um, and, and to practice. So if, even if there's an emergency situation, all EDs, um, emergency departments in UK will have um, management sheets for, for example, seizures, for, for asthmatic, um, really unwell asthmatic, uh, or head injuries, um, so the, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis or, or safe safeguarding. So all situations, they will have um, management sheets, so local guidance on, um, and, and also the acute management is quite similar. And then follow on management will be local guidance and local guidance. It's worth mentioning that you will use the local guidance or national guidance. So NICE produces national guidance quite, quite a lot. And, and so you can mention that that's, that's what you would use. You don't have to remember those guidance. Um, but if you know some bits, you can mention, um, but, but you would always refer to the local guidance. It's the same when it comes to prescribing. When I first came from India, I used to remember medical, um, me all medicines, um, the, the doses, because I, I, we used to prescribe. And, and so when I came here, it was such a difficult task for me to get that out of my head um, because the doses are different here. And, and, and so you, do, you don't, you, so you would use local formularies and local guidances to prescribe and, and to manage patients and you will also use evidence-based medicine. So that's, that's quite important. You mentioned the local guidance, local um, um, formulary. So the other thing we use is national guidance from NICE um, or, or BAPM, and, and we use, um, for, so we, you've heard of BNFC, British National Formulary. Uh, for, they have one for children, um, so you would use that as well. So you can use that as well. So that's, that's, uh, that's national. And in the scenarios, both medical stabilization and safeguarding skills may be tested. So the follow-on, so, so the initial assessment and, and um, so, so you assess, seek help, and um, you, you, you stabilize the child. And so the follow-on questions will be um, uh, discussing about the next steps and, and so um, be ready for it as well. So now um, going through the steps, so you can see the safe practice, that's always going to come first. And patient safety is the first priority. You assess the child yourself, make sure you're safe. Um, and if you do uh, all NLS or APLS, you will have similar algorithm, um, A, B, C, D, E, uh, A, B, C, D, E. So your assessment, clinical assessment is always starting with the same thing. Patient safety, A, B, C, A, B, C D, E. <coughs> Um, so, pay, so, um, so assess the child yourself and, and systematic approach uh, to assessment, which we'll go through in detail um, and um, work as part of a team. So it's remem remembering that you've got a team with you. And, and, and even if you go, if you call urgently to a &E, you will always have a team with you. The nursing staff, you might have other doctors, other specialists. Um, anesthetist, for example, if you want to have a management anesthetist of the right, so the prioritization delegation to the right people is quite important. They'll, they'll um, so you see, you work as a part of a team and, 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 um, and, and get help early. And also know who um, would, who you need to help you. Um, so essentially, and, and, and when you're, uh, you ask for help. Um, it can depend on situation, but if you're an ST1, I would prefer you ask, seek help earlier, because most of the clinical situations will be urgent or emergency, then um, when you are in the flow, because one of the things um, people forget is when you're in the flow of describing the situation and managing, you've already, um, one thing you've forgotten is, is seeking help. So I would start with um, safe practice, which is 
um, you would start with um, um, assessment. And while you say, I'm going to assess the child um, in, in, in a systematic manner using A, B, C, D, E, um, you, you would already say, I would, um, I would ask for senior help. Um, but you can, um, and also in some emergency situations, so if you have, a, for example, a newborn baby who's, who comes out um, um, moribund or, 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 or extremely um, unwell, you would uh, want two, 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 um, which is a peri arrest. It's the same for children. And so you would, you would um, put out a call for peri arrest so you will get the right team um, and you don't have to call individuals. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite useful to start thinking quite early on, seek help, patient safety, seek help, um, and, and they probably go hand in hand. Um, and, and, and then you, you go for assessment. When you, when you say it out loud, verbalize, say it, say it that way. And then you have a systematic approach to assessment. Um, and so I'm sure everyone's come, uh, gone through A, B, C, D, E. Um, so that's your primary assessment and resuscitation. And you um, assess and you manage as you go along. Um, so that's 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 quite important. So A is for airway. Uh, we we know that. Um, so it's you, you're looking for um, airway related problems. So you so, so essentially is the child is is uh, is airway patent? Um, uh, is there any kind of obstruction? You want to clear the obstruction if you can. If you if you, you don't don't do um, um, things which. It's difficult because you will have the right, um, then you can ask the anesthetist um, to come and, and um, clear the airway um, if, if it is difficult for you to reach. So essentially, all, you're, you're assessing for those things, airway patency, airway obstructions, and then you're looking for a breathing related, is the, is the child look less and feel, is the child breathing, is the, the, what's the respiratory rate? Um, and, and what's the effort of breathing like? Is the chest moving or efficiently or is it, is it just shallow breathing? Um, and you will also auscultate to see if the air entry is okay um, because you want to um, uh, also think about other reasons why your breathing can be affected quite badly like pneumothorax, hemothorax, um, uh, chest infection. Um, so, so you're, you're thinking and cardiovascular um, system, again, it's a similar thing. You're looking um, whether, whether the um, 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 uh, cardiac function is okay. So the things like what is the heart rate? Um, is the pulse um, weak? Is it, is, is it um, 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 bonding? And um, what, what, when you auscultate, you're looking for, is that a, um, is that a murmur? Is that because you, if you're a newborn, you could potentially have a cardiac collapse. An unknown cardiac collapse. So you're looking for: is there a murmur? Is, is there um, any uh, discrepancies in saturations pre and post ductal? Um, and and you're looking what the saturations generally. Um, and and so all, you see, so those those are the assessments. And and D um, is essentially is disability. So is there if if, if there's um, 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 you're looking for any hypoxia, um, uh, um, hypotension, and, and treat them as we go along, um, and um, and um, if, if, if there is any injuries, you see obvious injuries like bruises or, or um, anything which you need to um, start treating um, along with it. And E is expose um, the patient so that you're able to assess fully. But also remember when it comes to E, uh, patient dignity is absolute um, importance. Um, um, so, and, and so it's, it's, it's worth um, thinking about that as well, actually. And, and secondary assessment will be um, looking at the key features and, 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 uh, and urgent treatment. And then um, you would go for further management, which is complete history, taking examination and investigate, uh, ask the right investigations and, and further management. <laughs> so that's your ABCD. So is the patient breathing, uh, is there any um, noise is suggestive obstruction or choking. You're looking at airway maneuvers um, and, and, um, and knowing airway, different airway maneuvers because it differs for a child um, to a newborn um, and, and um, suction. If you can see anything which you can openly see um, and suction, don't do any blind suctions um, and, and seek help as, as soon as you can. Um, when it comes to pre, um, B, breathing, auscultation, chest expansion, look for respiratory rate saturations and think that if this child needs oxygen, needs oxygen straight away. Um, and then um, it's the same thing with um, C, um, your assessment. Um, and at this point, if you believe that this child is in shock, you, you might need to give um, fluid bolus. 
um, and and um, and our blood, for example, in certain conditions, and when the newborn is born with hypovolemia and, and lost a lot of blood during delivery, you might have to give blood. So either way, you need cannulation or umbilical venous line in, in a newborn situation and a fluid bolus or blood in that situation. And the D is your um, AFCO assessment. So some are used to Glasgow Coma Scale. So it's a more detailed assessment of neurological status, but, but um, AFCO is... is, is um, probably a, a short version of it, and it's probably um, um, and what we usually use um, in, in, in an emergency situation um, because it gives you a neurological status of a, of a child uh, um, very quickly. So A is for alert, V is, is for response for voice, and P is response for pain, e, uh, U is unresponsive. You're looking for temperature, glucose, seizures, and treat as you go along with it. hypoglycemic. Treat, give a dextrose bolus. If they're seizing, start your uh, seizure protocol. Um, and if they're cold, make sure that they, they um, start warming up um, and, and you have um, um, certain um, things in place like bear huggers and, and, and um, um, in newborn just various terms so that radiant heat is so that you start warming up because the response um, um, is better once they, they warm up and also the outcomes are better. Um, and E, you're looking for rashes and, and uh, other examination message. And, and remember patient dignity. The IV, I, I'm repeating this is because I've seen um, I, not once, at least a couple of times where, where in, the, in the rush of things, pe people don't recognize um, the dignity is, is essential. They would completely uh, strip them. Um, and, and if it's, that, and, and that might not be in a newborn baby, that's absolutely fine. But in an older child, um, and um, it's useful to say it out loud, because um, and that he would um, remember that as well. Okay, so initial management. We've we've looked at um, a, a brief thoughts on A, B, C, D. Prepare well, because that's um, it's it's always you start with that patient safety, seek help, A, B, C, D, and you reassess once you've done the. A, B, C, D, and, and, um, and you treat it as you go along. If there is any situation needs treating, urgent situation needs treating, um, um, and, and, it, and, and then the secondary management, uh, secondary assessment, and, and looking for the key features and, and urgent treatment comes. That's, that's, the, that's the step. Wise. Um, so there may be some cases where this is a little more flexible, but always keep patient safety in mind. That is, that is the... Um, Priority. So, so but, but it depends on the case, um, uh, how your ABCD reassessment uh, urgent treatment uh, order is. Um, but remember patient safety. So the next step for, after the initial assessment um, is further management. And so while you're seeking help, while your help is arriving, um, they will always want you to go through this further management because. Um, as an assessor, I would never give you help unless I know your basic um, further management and, and your, your, your understanding of the situation, your initial assessment, and, and, and then how would you manage? So once that is done, I, I might ask um, your consultant to be suddenly magically appear for you um, towards with you and, and help you. So until then, um, we usually don't. We, we like you to go through the situation. So further management is essential. So initial steps, um, you will uh, already have a differential diagnosis, hopefully. Um, and there might be an obvious cause um, um, and that then you treat. And for that, like you might know this child is an asthmatic, um, is coming um, 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 a respiratory failure secondary to um, a severe asthmatic attack, or you might know this child is, is, is a diabetic um, and, and he's come in DKA. Um, and, and so your, your treatment options then is, is a bit more, uh, or he's, he's seizing, and we don't know the reason, but he's got seizures. Um, so, so it's essentially, um, you will have a set, set way of treatment. And, and, and um, but, but then there are other things where it might be like newborn baby who comes very, well, looks very unwell, um, uh, presence around day three, day four, day five. So you've got multiple reasons there. It could be sepsis, it could be cardiac collapse, uh, known diagnosis, it could be metabolic. 
it could be safeguarding. So, so, so there, your your treatment is is your initial assessment and management is the same, but the go, follow on treatment is a bit more broad. You're treating sepsis with antibiotics. You're you're you're, you're, you're treating your collapse, and you are also um, 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 looking for metabolic side of things by um, starting metabolic investigations. Um, so you, you you're looking at a bit more broader, and you and you're also possibly thinking of safeguarding if there is any concern and then you're invest, initiating safeguarding investigations so, so so it can be very specific or, or broader based on the, the, the clinical situation so you, you 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 are expected to show that you would take um, a complete history um um so you, you would take a history of, of this child um, um from parents um, examination once the child is stable. So complete history, examine thoroughly, and then you plan your investigations to help you um, um, help confirm your diagnosis. And, and after that, straight after that, you would start your acute management, further acute management, and, and, and also think about any long-term issues which needs to be addressed. Always mention when it comes to management, local guidelines, national guidelines, uh, local formulary BNFC um, or BNF, um, so which is British National Formulary, so which which is useful. Um, um, and and uh, also once this is all done, think about where this child is going. Could be PICU or NICU or a ward if the, if you believe the child is stable enough to be managed in a ward, or, or some wards will have a, a high dependency unit, so would go there. Um, and, and also uh, who you need to to help you um, it's it's quite important and because every every hospital will have a, um, a clear plan of so if it's an acute situation who would come and help like for example if the airway related issue um, anesthetist will be there to help um, so you need to call them and um, so peri arrest will call all of them um, to 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 um, but that's it's just like knowing who to who who you need um, um, to help and your senior is always always someone you need. Um, think about the child and family. So this is absolute important. The other most important thing when it comes, um, when you've done all those things and, and it's so important, um, but we forget, I would say almost always in the heat of clinical thinking, we believe our um, assessment and management is the paramount thing, but, but um, Think about the child and family. Need to explain to them is, is very very important. So it's you you might be busy managing acute situation. Assume this is an emergency and you're managing a emergency with with your senior colleague and you so you've got no time to um, go and and essentially talk to the family, which is fair enough. You will do that once the child you've done your initial management, further management, child is stable, and, and then you would go speak. But remember, when you do all these things, the family is there um, standing and watching and, and they're petrified. So you you, you would say um, uh, uh, the final step is all the way through, um, you would have asked or, or delegated a nurse, a junior nurse, or, or a senior nurse, whoever is available, um, who's free at that point, um, to um, help um, um, and a family and, and communicate with family all the way through. So they are supporting the family um, all the way through. And once you've done, you would go and speak to them. Um, and, and if you seen, once your senior comes, you would ask the senior or your senior would go and speak to them. As you wouldn't ask, they will go um, and speak to them. So you can mention um, that you also recognize the importance of families and communicating with families or continuously. Um, um, so that is something you would, you would explain. Um, <coughs> just a, a quick summary of structure, um, uh, which we've discussed to you. So essentially, um, um, patient safety, assess the patient, ABCD is always your um, 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 mode of assessment, and resuscitation first followed by urgent treatment, full history, examination, investigations to confirm the diagnosis, um, and the further management um, would be looking at the acute long-term issues and, and treat and address as you go along, manage in accordance with the guidance, local, national, use your local formularies, national formularies um, to prescribe and treat. What is the child going, uh, where is, and also think about where is the child going and, and, and who, who you would need 
um, to help you and communicate with family. So that's the summary structure. So this is, if you say in that order, and, and, and remember that order, that that is essentially all I expect in, in, in the clinical scenario and our marking is, is, is based on that. And, and, and that's it. it's a quick touch upon safeguarding um, um, because you might get a safeguarding case um, um, or you might have a situation which is not safeguarding, but um, they might point you towards it's an acute situation, but also think about safeguarding. So it's worth remembering safeguarding all the time and knowing a little bit. Um, so, uh, so safeguarding scenario, scenario should be approached exactly the same structure. So patient safety, assess the patient first, A, B, C, D, E, and, and treat ABC, ABC along, with, along the way and, and resuscitation first followed by urgent treatment. Full, and then you go for full history, examination, investigations, and which will help you to confirm diagnosis and further management, exactly the same structure. Um, so the, the main things, there are a few um, red flags in, when it comes to safeguarding. So this is, this is um, if this, these things happen, you would immediately point out, this is something I, I'm, I'm unsure about and, and this this seems um, 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 I would need to um, um, initiate um, a safeguarding related um, management. So if there is a history which is quite vague, which lacks detail and, and the history is not compatible with the injury or, or the child's development age and, and if they say basically a, a five month old comes with, with a femur fracture and they say the child was crawling or, or there he was in the bed, rolled over, fell. Um, it's, those stories don't really add up. So you oh, it's already alarm bells ringing. So you would start thinking about um, safeguarding and, and any inconsistent story. Uh, sometimes mom has one story, dad has one story, grandmother has another story. So you, you, you worry about this. Um, and delay in seeking medical attention. So th th sometimes it might be genuine. They didn't notice it, but you, it doesn't matter from a doctor's point of view, you have to immediately think safeguarding. Um, and, and that is how um, you pick up. Otherwise you'll, we, we will miss out things. Multiple previous injuries and that multiple attendances secondary to for, for injuries and, um, and child's interaction with carers, um, can be abnormal and child's um, child itself might not be very unkempt and all of those things brings you um, some some um, um, concerns and, and um, it's it's worth then thinking about safeguarding and taking safeguarding route as well. Um, so it's in safeguarding route, if, if you think that the one of the di differential diagnosis is also safeguarding, um, so you should mention this to the uh, assessor that you think there is something uh, worrying when it comes to safeguarding side of point of things. And, and, and how would you um, look at that? How would you manage that would be is get help. Your consultant is likely the first point of contact when it comes to children safeguarding. So you do your initial assessment, uh, history, management, all those things you've done. And then you speak to your consultant and, and they are the next ones to come and assess and, and, and take, the, take it to the next level. Um, so others depends on safeguarding processes local to your area. Um, so which, which means once you've discussed with your consultant, you might want to uh, discuss with social workers, um, social workers team, and, and there, will, there might be a social child protection team within the unit at that point. Um, um, because if it's 3 a.m., you, you might not be able to. But if it's the working hours, child protection team would be another team you would want to um, call and, and inform um, and um, take history from patient where able and ask open questions, uh, recording information in their own words. That's important. Um, record information in their own words. Think about place of safety and other children that may require protection. So if you believe this child is being harmed and if they have three other children in the house, you, you always uh, worry that the other three children might have been harmed. So, so when it, when it comes to the um, 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 discussion with consultant and social working team, the social workers team, it's worth mentioning that. And and, and then the next step would be to um, until this uh, safeguarding investigation is done, um, they they will seek um, seek out um, those other children and, and 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 find a safe place for them. Communication is key. 
most of the safeguarding cases, um, it becomes a huge issue because of communication. So it's, it's quite important um, you are empathetic towards parents because some of them might not be safeguarding, um, but we still are worried. And so we do take through safeguarding and it, it is, whether it is or not, it's gonna put parents through a huge amount of stress um, um, and, and some of them have huge breakdown. Um, and, and so it's important our communication is, is, is empathetic. It's, um, um, it's understanding their issues, but equally where you come from as, as a, um, a child's advocate is his safety is paramount and, and, and you are looking at him. And, and you have certain steps um, um, to follow. It's the processes, which is, is trust-based. It's nothing personal. You see, there are certain trust processes, but as soon as you're worried about safeguarding, you'll have to follow. So you don't have to say, I'm worried about safeguarding. So this bruise, um, so assume that they come with a bruise, you say, so this bruise is, uh, is, is something I'm worried about. And and as uh, and the trust guidance is that we have to um, initiate safeguarding process and 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 we are um, initiating safeguarding process because that's something we have to um, look at and rule out and I'll involve um, um, a consultant senior senior person which is a consultant and and you can ask whether they have a social worker if they have someone that we can and if they're available we can get them in um, and and so you can you can do it in a very sensitive way which will still stress them out and still worry them, but and, and but they will recognize this is something we have to do and they will let us go through. But in spite of everything, sometimes it is very difficult, but it's this is something if an, as an assessor, um, I would want to hear that you would uh, be discussing this um, with parents in a very sensitive way. So if you're admitting on, uh, 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 on account of a child protection, concern, you need to be able to raise this with families in a very sensitive way. So that's the main thing. And accurate documentation is absolutely essential because in some situations, it's just different stories coming um, um, from the same person to different. So, so if an SHO goes and um, uh, speaks to um, uh, a mom, mom gives you a story and then the consultant goes, they give a completely different story. So it's important that the documentation is very accurate. So you mentioned that accurate documentation is essential because then when you sit down and look through the story, um, it's two different stories. That already is another red flag. Um, so there is the right RCPCH right, child protection companion, which is which is an excellent source, and also RCPCH runs courses like CPRR, and and you can say that you that's level two safeguarding. You would sit, um, which will give you a bit more um, understanding and and um, experience. So there are other things which you can add to any scenario. So there are a list of things. Um, um, it's worth mentioning it, including communication, problem solving, decision making, empathy, sensitivity, um, managing others, team involvement, organizing and planning, management leadership. So there's teaching, research, audit, um, and also worth remembering that most situations now you can do a CBD um, um, and, and work, which is a, which is part of your um, assessment, um, um, uh, which is part of your ARCP, and um, and and um, so it's, it's worth mentioning it as well. So, so we'll quickly. I don't, I don't think we have much time, so we have probably ten minutes. We'll go through a couple of scenarios, uh, if that's okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you can join in. If you can join in, please join in, or you can actually put put in your chat what your opinions are. What how would you manage? So you are in a DGH, um, and the nurses call you uh, to come and assess, um, um, come to the assessment unit to see urgently see a patient they are worried about. Patient is a six year old girl who was attended with difficulty breathing. She has a background of eczema. She developed a cough forty eight hours ago, and over the past twelve hours has been increasingly short of breath. What do you guys think in this situation? Um, how would your initial, um, what is your initial assessment? When you call, do you, of course you go in straight um, and how would you assess? Please, um, you, can, you can write down in your notes um, um, in, uh, or put it in the chat, whichever way. Have, um, it's worth uh, thinking through. So you, you go see the patient straight away, so urgently, and your assessment starts, think about patient safety, and your assessment starts A, B, C, D, E. Um, 
see here airway is patent and uh, um, when it looks at breathing the the child is breathing fifth respiratory rate is 55 sacs are 91 percent um and there is a, a slight expiratory wheeze almost like a silent chest um so you would think what do you think in, in, in this situation and, and how would you manage um so you start oxygen straight away and in your head you're thinking um, asthmatic or asthma attack, um, respiratory failure secondary to that. Um, your heart rate is, then you look at C, heart rate is 150, capillary refill time is less than two seconds, PP is normal and pulse volume is normal. But the, ch and, and, but the child is very agitated and, and cooperative and you see eczematic ash um, and, and, and so your assessment would be this child is a sick child um, and you need help. So you call for help straight away um, and, and then you start your urgent management while, while your help is arriving. Urgent treatment of acute severe asthma. Um, um, so of course, what you would know um, is dependent on your level of training, but it's useful to know your early training because even if you've not done PEDS, and, and I'm, I'm sure in medicine, it's quite similar to start with. It will, will be nebulized um, salbutamol, tropium. Uh, we would give steroids um, straight away. Uh, if, if they can take orally, give orally. If not, you would give um, IV cort um, hydrocortisone um, and, and, and then reassess. Then you, you will think about next step, whether they need magnesium sulfate, salbutamol, laminophilin, um, and, and, and whether they need um, and next level support if their breathing is getting compromised, whether you need anesthetist along um, and, and all those things, you will start thinking. And, and also once the child is stable, you would love to think about where the child should go, PICU, or is the, baby st is the child stable enough to go to pediatric wards. Check local guidelines and BNF um, prescribing always. So after that the initial stage, you do a full history examination, make a plan for ongoing acute and long-term management. Acute would be depending on how the scenario progresses, how the assessor tells you the scenario progresses. The child is getting better, discuss with consultant, admit to ward, write up regular steroids, assess for NEBS. You would always start with hourly and then gradually stretch as the child gets better. Not getting better, discuss with consultant, do we need to think about PICU and the escalation of treatment? You might need a spirit to support. Um, like when intubation, ventilation, good things. Long term, um, if there are um, features of chronic asthma, um, and and so you would that would come out with history and would this child warrant a regular inhaler um, so, and so an education on asthma and triggers for um, for family. So communicate with family, explain diagnosis, what you've done, and need for further management. So the other things you would always think in this situation is team working, use your team, because it's never an individual can manage a situation. So when I go into a, um, a situation, I'm, and now I'm, I'm a consultant, I take a step back and all, all I do is leading, but I have four or five members and I designate, I tell them what to do. Um, everyone gets, so it's, it's always teamwork never an individual can manage everything and um, so it's worth mentioning that i would use my um, team i would delegate to my team um, and 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 um, and use also the opportunity to debrief with the team so that's another thing any acute situation once the child is stable and gone and if you can you will have debriefing because it can be quite traumatic for the for the entire team um, so you would you would use opportunity to debrief so that's another thing and then, um, of course, you would discuss with the consultant um, and, and if you can get a CPD done, that's another tick for you. So the next scenario, um, so I'll go through quickly because a couple of scenarios. Um, so you, you, you will see a child, um, and you, you, you're called to see a four-year-old boy in pediatric assessment unit who's been brought by his grandmother. She regularly looks after the child when his parents are busy and um, on packing him up today, she has noticed a rash on one of his hands. She's done the glass test and this rash doesn't fade. So she, she has brought him to the to, to a &E to be seen. <coughs> She's been unable to speak to the child's parents to find out if this rash was there previously as they're not answering their phones. So how would you assess and manage this patient? So you've, you've got a um, couple of minutes, um, you're walking and what would you think? So when you first think rash is always, um, 
um, and, and tumbler test is what they're saying. So the, and, and so that is uh, uh, meningitis is one thing you would think of. So infection, and meningitis, and, and what are the thought process? But either way, um, your assessment is the same. Patient safety, A, B, C, D, E. Um, um, and then you recognize when you do the ABCD, the child is very well and the observations are all normal. And, and so you, you don't have to support from that point. And then when it comes to assessment of, of your, um, and when it comes to D and you look at it, the rash looks like, like that. Um, so for um, uh, erythematous, um, sorry, for uh, lesions, circumcised lesions on the back of the right hand, and there are no signs of spreading erythema and no other lesions anywhere. So you kind of know, um, this is probably not um, meningitis, but these rash are quite specific um, to a, a certain um, situation. Uh, so, uh, so once you see the rash, you extend it examination um, and and um, five, minutes, five minutes left, Dr. Navi. Arch, yes, thank you. Um, so you, you want to know clear timeline, grandmother's perspective. She might not have that um, fully, but whatever her perspective. Um, ask the patient how they got this mask. Six, um, six year old might be able to say general appearance of the child, any other marks or bruises. Um, so he, immediately you're safeguarding this, this because they are, for me, they are cigarette burn marks. And so you're thinking about that. Review previous medical history, ED presentations, ask um, the grandmother if she has got any concerns, ask about social work involvement in the past and see how the child is interacting with the grandmother. All those things are, are useful. Observe, ask. And the differential diagnosis of would include cigarette burns. Patient safety first, any additional medical intervention needed. So you might need certain investigations um, because each unit will have safeguarding investigations and processes. You would follow the local policies, processes. Tr so trigger safeguarding processes in line with local policy. Discuss with your consultant. Think of place of, about place of safety and refer to social work local safeguarding team. So that's, um, that is safeguarding situation. Um, and then you communicate with family. So you have to be very sensitive um, and, and, um, and but very clear what your concerns are and, and what will happen next. Um, so don't skirt around safeguarding. Say you would say your concerns are safeguarding in this situation. You think this is cigarette burns. You would speak to the consultant and you've got a set of processes you have to follow as per the local guidance. And, and your priority is child safety. And that, that's, that's, that's how it is. And opportunity for learning is CBD, something safeguarding CBD you can do with it. This one, um, um, if you have one minute, we'll just go through um, and, and then we'll finish it. So, uh, so again, this is a newborn, a five day old, um, normal delivery, but he's been feeding poorly for the last 24 hours, lethargic. So the um, baby's come to ED, the ED colleague thinks, Baby has reflex started Gaviscon, but the nurse is worried, so she's called you in. Um, and when you go see the child um, urgently, because the nurse is worried, you go straight because they know uh, about unwell children. And so your assessment is still the same: patient safety, A, B, C, D, E, A is patent, um, B, um, you, you can see the respiratory rate is quite high, SACs are 92 low, so start oxygen, heart rate is very high, 192, pulse is difficult to feel, capillary refill time is seven seconds cool peripherally, pa pa patient is shutting down. So you would start cannula, bloods, fluids. <coughs> the child is only responsive to pain. Hypothermic, hypoglycemic, you would treat those things, warm the child up, and the rest of the assessment looks okay. Um, and reassess. This is a sick child, so you would seek help. You call for your senior straight away. Um, and in here, your differential diagnosis includes multiple things, including sepsis, could be a congenital cardiac disease, which which stuff is closing um, and metabolic child protection. So you're thinking, could it um, all of this and treating everything? Give antibiotics straight away because it's important you give as soon as decisions are diagnosed to antibiotics should be 60 minutes. And then you give extended history examination and investigations. So that's the step. What investigations would you do? Routine CRP, full blood count, blood culture, um, chest x-ray and, and um, possibly lumbar puncture once you think the child is stable enough. You want to gas with lactate and you start your initial metabolic investigations. And if you believe cardiac, do you want to ask for echo as well. You have two minutes left. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm finished actually. Discuss with consultant um, and, and um, see where the child needs to go, PICU and ICU. 
and, and use the local guidances to prescribe and, 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 and communicate parents. So other things you learn is debriefing, CBD, and feedback. To summarize, um, so clinical scenario is, is something um, and, uh, we are expecting you to think and have a knowledge for your level. Um, and you always start with um, an, an um, assessment. Patient safety is, remembering patient safety is paramount and you would, uh, your assessment would be A, B, C, D, E and, and resuscitate urgently as, as you go. Um, and you, then you take a full history examination and, in, and follow on investigations to confirm the diagnosis. And then you go to the further management, uh, so acute management and then longer term management. Manage using the local guidances and local formularies and think about where the child should go and communicate with family. And in this one thing, remember, seek help very early, which I've not put down. So I think when you do the ABCD, you can mention already that you, you would like to seek help senior. That's all I have to say. Okay, uh, I'll just lend less than one minute, but there's one question. Uh, so in the station, will we have a role player, the family or the examiner? And as long as I'm going through the A, B, C, D, the examiner will give us the finding of each part. That's a question. Yes. Yeah. So that's uh, absolutely. So, so when when you say once a scenario, once you know the scenario, you would say um, that basically I'm 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 going to start assessment of the child. I would go in urgently straight away. I would start assess the patient, knowing patient safety is paramount. And my assessment would be in the order of A, B, C, D, E. And then you would ask, um, um, so it might be already in the scenario, but you would, if, if not, you would ask, um, when, when I assess A, B, C, D, E, could you, would you be able to tell me how, what the airway is like? Um, um, and breathing, cardiovascular, D, what, what are the findings? E, um, what are the findings? Um, so they, they'll tell you the findings and your management plan so if you A, they say the child is choking or you, you can see an obvious obstruction, then you would want to see how you clear the obstruction safely. Um, and, um, but if they say patent, you go to the next step, breathing, they might say such like, like here, the scenario was the SATs were 92, respiratory rate was 65, then um, um, an and auscultation. They, they, if, they, if they tell you findings, they're expecting, um, it, treat like oxygen, start oxygen. But if they say there is less um, um, air entry on one side, or if they say paradoxical chest movement, they're kind of in, in hinting uh, pneumothorax. That will be more for a senior trainee, so ST4. <coughs> they're thinking whether would you, would you think um, needle thoracocentesis, would you think chest strain, um, how would you think about relieving? So th they would give you the scenario um, as you go along. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Navin, for this very, very useful talk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. All the best. Hope everything goes well. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. So uh, to our next station, Leadership and Governance with Dr. William Tuhi. So Dr. William is a consultant pediatrician for the last five years. Dr. William is a consultant pediatrician for the last five years. Uh, he has been working in uh, he has been working in East London and Essex Park in Harving Redbridge University Hospital. Currently, he is a CYP assessment unit lead at Queens and the Halley Ward at uh, Kings George Hospital. Also, Children's Acute Transport Service and uh, children and uh, Children's ED liaison for trust. He's a certified EPALS e instructor. Work, uh, his work uh, interests are acute pediatric stabilization of sick children and governess. He's a married father with one boy, a keen photographer, and a self confessed nerd. Welcome. Good morning, uh, Dr. William. Good morning, everyone. Um, I didn't appreciate you'd probably read the whole biography out, but thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak uh, to you today. Um, I'm hoping I'm coming through nice and clear to you all. Um, and I apologize, I've not used Zoom for quite a while. So if there's a little bit of a technical hitch, I do apologize. I'm going to try and share my screen and show my slides. Um, thank you, Nuha, specifically for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, I'm not sure why you sought me out for this subject. Of all the things you could have asked me to teach, leadership and governance, I was like, oh dear. Um, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, 
from I guess my point of view, um, I can't be any more authoritative than a relatively young consultant who's been working in the UK for a period of time. Um, so talking about leadership and governance, I've obviously been through the training scheme. I've been a consultant for a few years now. Um, I was our governance lead for a year. Um, I think that's given me, or let me sort of dip my toes in the water a little bit, learning about leadership and governance. But I wouldn't say it makes me an authority, but I'll do my very best to help you through um, some of the questions and give you some guidance on where to go, really. Um, my presentation consists of a little bit of background information um, about the subject and then um, I'm going to go through some scenarios that Nua sent me um, and try and sort of give you some ideas on how best to answer these questions if you're giving them an interview. Um, I apologise because I think that the scenarios are mostly kind of registrar tailored, but I can certainly ask, um, and I do expect um, some input from the audience in terms of offering me some suggestions and answers. And um, this is very much going to be an active participation session. Um, so please, you know, questions, suggestions, anything else as we go along. Um, and I can always try and ask for alternative answers uh, as if you're an ST1, because I understand we've got ST1s and ST3 Fords. Is that right, Nuha? Yeah, exactly. We have both ST1 uh, level, ST3 and 4. Thank you, Lovely. William, to be with Lovely. us. And if you have <clears> any <throat> slides, you are co-host now and you can um, share your slides um, okay. if you have ones. Thank you. I'll give it a go. Um, the other thing I'll say as well, um, I am very English in the way I speak. So if anyone is not clear on something I've said, or if I use a colloquialism, or if I speak very quickly, ask me to slow down, ask me to repeat myself. I don't mind. Okay. Right, I'm going to now try and share my presentation. Uh, it's terrible. I'm really good at using Teams. Then you go and stick me on Zoom and I've got no idea. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, let me start the presentation because that's probably the most useful thing to do. Right. Okay. Um, Right, can you all see my slides? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try and start the slideshow and see if that will yes, it's, go. It's clear. Okay. I think what I will do is I will just bear with me, everyone. Very sorry. Right. Can you see my actual slides? Are they moving? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, you've got to see my fancy transitions as well. I can't possibly skip to the first slide without showing you the transition. So I'm going to talk about leadership and governance uh, and we today's date and everything else. So what is leadership? Um, firstly, um, now I'm really sad. I can't see any of your faces. If you've got cameras, please turn them on just that it gives me a little bit of feedback. And also it's nice to know when people are laughing at what I'm saying, because if they're not laughing, then I'm, I'm talking to a dead audience and that's not great. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so I can see Fad, I can see Raoul, and I can see Nuha. Welcome. Um, so what is leadership? A um, bit of a tricky question. And I think leadership, we all kind of know it's it's the kind of presence of, of taking the team with you and, um, you know, the properties needed for someone to lead a team. And that's a bit of a dry kind of definition. It doesn't really tell you much about what leadership is or what, what a good leader is. Um, and I'm always the way I talk about leadership or the way I think about a good leader, um, when you're in that situation at work or any other sort of situation, and you know the one I'm talking about, it's really hitting the fan. You're worried. Everyone's anxious. There's a sick patient or an angry patient or an angry member of staff, uh, and everyone's really kind of concerned, doesn't know what to do. The good leader is the person that walks into the room and everyone kind of takes that breath. They kind of go, we're really happy this person's here. We're really happy this person's going to take charge. Um, and it's it's the ability to be able to do that. I think that's what demonstrates good leadership. If people, based on their experience of working with you, um, kind of take that breath and know that the situation is going to be handled or at least is going to be sort of more in control when they're there. I think that's good leadership. Now, that's all very well saying that. I always think it's nice to sort of look at some quotes and see if there's anyone that can kind of sum it up better than me, because I'm not a philosopher and I certainly wouldn't, you know, say that I'm an expert in talking about these sorts of things. So I pulled up some quotes. <clears throat> so uh, he who has never learned to obey cannot be a good commander. And this is Aristotle, a very famous philosopher. And basically what we're talking about here is humility. 
Um, if you've never been a good team member, you can't really hope to ever be a good leader. If you've never learned to kind of work with other people and negotiate those difficulties, then I think it's really difficult um, to then kind of lead from the front. Uh, Fu Shan Wan is a Chinese philosopher. Um, there are three essentials to leadership, humility, clarity, and courage. And I think that kind of sums up what we've already said. Um, this is an unknown and it's probably a sports um, coach of some description, probably an American sports coach going by the language. My responsibility is getting all my players playing for the name in front of the jersey, not the one on the back. Now, some of you don't understand what that means. Generally, in American sports, definitely, the name on the front of the jersey is the team name. Okay, so you're playing for the organization and the name on the back of the jersey is the individual is the person that's all about working together with the organization, all about making sure that the organization's priorities are your priority. Um, and then Dwight Eisenhower is a famous American president. Um, you don't lead by hitting people over the head. That's assault, not leadership. And I think that's a really good thing to remember. You can get people to do what you want them to do to some extent by forcing it. But at the end of the day, it's going to tire people out and you're not going to win over hearts and minds to get you to do what you want to do. OK, I think these are some really nice quotes. These kind of sum up what I feel about leadership. And I think for you, it's important to have your own ideas of what you think good leadership is and develop your own leadership style, because how I lead a situation and how I deal with things is not necessarily how you would do it. Um, if anyone's worked with me and I know knew her and uh, a few other people here have definitely worked with me, I tend to try and if possible, be calm, collected, be that person. That hopefully people take a deep breath when they come into the room and are happy is there. Um, but I can crack the whip if I need to. I can say to people that I want this done and make it very clear what I want done at the time. And that's my leadership style, but it might not be someone else's. New her is a very quiet, very sort of little voice at the back of the room, but she still manages to get things done. She remains perfectly calm. Sorry, Nuha, I'm picking on you, but I work with you and you're right at the top of my screen, I'm afraid. Um, but I think, you know, find your leadership style, know what works for you, know what makes, makes it so that you can deal with the situation well, okay? Now, it's great having good examples. I thought I'd find a really bad example of leadership and what is not good leadership. And I went to my go-to for bad examples of everything, and that's Homer Simpson, okay? Everyone knows who Homer Simpson is, yeah? Please, yeah. Three sentences that get you through life. Number one, cover for me. Number two, oh, good idea, boss. And Number three, it was like that when I got here. I don't really think I have to say anything more than that, okay? Do I have bad leadership, okay? So that's leadership for me. And then governance. Now, if you're trained in the UK, governance is one of those really dry subjects that no one really likes talking about because it is just kind of not that interesting. Everyone wants to talk about the sick patient and managing that resource and all that sort of thing. Um, and governance as well. I mean, I found this definition. The way that organisations or countries are managed at the highest level and the systems for doing this, it doesn't really excite anyone, does it? It's not really the sort of thing that interests anyone, OK? Um, but I thought I'd break it down. And governance is a way that rules, norms, and actions, and in the NHS, that's our policies, our protocols, our rules for how we work, work we do things at work. So it's how they're structured, sustained, regulated, and held accountable. And the last part, I think, for me is really important. I'm going to come back to that in the next slide. Um, but it's basically how we um, how we maintain and make sure our leadership is working properly. Okay, um, so we make sure that we are doing things properly, that there are checks and balances on that. There are feedback loops that make sure that when things are happening, that we're making sure we're still working to the gold standard and all these sorts of things. So that's what governance is. Um, and there's loads about it on, on um, internets and various other places. You can get lots of resources about it. Um, it's a good idea to have um, a working model in your own head of how governance works in your organization and in your trust and within the NHS. Um, knowing what incident forms are, knowing what serious incidents are, red incidents, knowing how these things are carried out. So find your governance lead and maybe go to a meeting and sit in on these things and find out how they work, um, especially if you're going for an ST3-4 interview, because it may feel like it's really early, you're not a consultant yet, but you do start to need to understand how these things are. Um, and I've worked with lots of trainees from overseas to try and reduce your anxiety about these things. Because I'm not sure how things work in the various places that people have worked in outside of the UK. Um, but I do know that it creates quite a bit of anxiety for doctors that have come into the UK and working in the system. I think whether it is they're used to what 
the American system's like and the amount of litigation that's involved or others, perhaps other countries where there's a lot of litigation and a lot of personal accountability. Um, but I think knowing how things work in the UK, knowing not to be worried about things like complaints and SIs, knowing that these are structured things to improve systems, not to sort of sling blame at people is a really important thing to know. Um, and having experience of if you've been through an SI or following someone else through an SI, so the person who's investigating or a complaint, it, it can to some extent put you at ease and makes you more confident dealing with these sorts of things in future. So when that parent says they're going to complain or when you found out you've got to give a statement for an SI or something like that, then hopefully you're able to deal with it in a more mature manner and hopefully not be so worried about it when it comes up. It also means you're going to be more capable of answering questions about an interview when you have to, which is a really good thing as well. OK, has anyone got any questions about that so far? OK, I'll move on to the next slide then. So I think I've really spoken about this a bit already, but why are leadership and governance important? OK, and for me, there are two um, concepts really that these these are really play into. The first one is providing and maintaining good medical practice. There is some excellent information on the General Medical Council website, and I'm going to give a link in particular to um, some uh, structured e-learning um, on the GMC website about maintaining good medical practice. It's basically lots of scenarios, but it feeds back into all the tenets and all the policies about good medical practice on the GMC website. So not just relevant to paediatrics, but relevant to all kind of good medical practice. Um, but that's one reason. And the other thing is the concept of accountability and responsibility. And I'll just talk about these briefly. Um, Responsibility is the duty you have for a task, okay? And responsibility can be shared. So me as a consultant, if I ask you to perform a task for me, go and do X investigation on a patient or go and see this patient or go and find out if such and such test can be done or go and do this child protection medical, something like that. I'm sharing the responsibility for that duty with you. I'm asking you to go and do that. And you're responsible for doing that task, but you can then go on and share that responsibility with your SHO, the nurses you work with, the other professionals you work with, okay? That's responsibility. And accountability is different. Accountability is the ultimate kind of responsibility. It's where it sits. And generally per patient basis, accountability lies with the consultant, okay? So, in the best system in the world, all things being um, well maintained and all things being done as they should be, if something bad happens, if, if a patient does have an adverse event, is sick, although you're responsible maybe for carrying out part of the task associated with that, the accountability for it, the ultimate responsibility lies with the consultant and the, ultimate, the accountability for all patients lies with the organisation you work for. It lies with the trust, it lies with the NHS, okay? And I'm saying this because, again, I've worked with lots of trainees from overseas um, and I think they're worried and they practice in such a way that they are concerned that if something happens or if something doesn't go the right way, that someone's going to come and blame them. Someone's going to complain against them, sue them personally. And for the most part, unless you go out of your way to be completely negligent and cause a patient harm, if you have, a, if there is a genuine mistake, then ultimately you're involved in a process to improve that and sort that out, but you are not ultimately accountable for what's happened. Um, if I am responsible for training you and supervising you properly, and for whatever reason, something doesn't go well, then I'm accountable for that. And it's a case of, I need to look at this, whether you maybe need some more support, some more learning, or maybe the situation was the one that you shouldn't have been put in in the first place. Okay. Is that clear? Does everyone kind of appreciate that? Um, yes. it's not an easy thing to grasp and it's something that even I still struggle a little bit with and it's only till you get to be a, get sort of consultant level and you've dealt with a few cases that are kind of SIs and all this sort of thing you, you kind of understand this a little bit okay but this is to me why leadership and governance are important um it's making sure we're doing things properly and making sure that the everyone is acting responsibly and that accountability sits where it should do okay that's the heavy stuff out of the way. I'm going to move on to the scenarios, if that's all that we want. Now, the scenarios, if I'm running okay to time, not bad. Um, I'm going to read the scenario out. I'm going to put it on the screen so you can all see it, and I'm going to read it out. And I'm going to move on to another slide that's going to be mostly blank. And I'm going to be asking about what your priorities are in the situation you're dealing with. 
and what your actions would be okay there's one that kind of stands out at the end that's just a straightforward question um but the others are all kind of a, a clinical scenario that you may come across okay so number one uh you are the pediatric registrar uh on a night shift um and the nursing charge in the emergency department this is very covid um centered as well this scenario by the way and i don't think there may be as many that are covid centered but it may well be but it could apply to a different scenario the nurse in charge of the emergency department informed you that your SA chair is refusing to see patients triaged to the red zone, so suspected COVID patients, and the nurse informed you that the SA chair was abrupt and rude when they were asked to see these patients. Okay, so how would you manage this situation? I want you all to take a sort of a minute or two to think about it, and that's something I would advise you to do when you're in an interview, because these scenarios they're kind of a big lump of information all at once. And the first thing you should do is try and absorb that and make sure you've heard all the information. And if in the stress and the kind of excitement of the interview, you've not heard half of what's said to you, um, either have a little notepad, which I think you can do in interviews. I'm not sure if you can still do it anymore, but certainly you can ask them to repeat the question or repeat it back to them. And actually repeating the question back shows that you have heard what's being said and then you can answer it hopefully in a, a reasonably authoritative way. Okay. Sorry, I've talked over your thinking time there. So Pediatric registrar on the night shift, nurse in ED um, says that the SHO is supposed to be seeing COVID patients has said no and was abrupt and rude. Okay. So what do we think are our priorities in this case? And anyone on the open floor, because I don't think we can do hands on Zoom, can we? So please, um, if anyone's got anything they want to suggest, please suggest. Yeah, there is some response in the chat box. Sorry? Oh there's, a, oh, there's a chat box, obviously, yeah. yeah. There okay. is a chat box and there are some responses on the chat box. Okay, uh, so first I'll assess the patient and manage, then speak to the SHO later, okay? Uh, review patient, assign someone else. Uh, patient is safe and stable, fine. So everyone's got the kind of first priorities to make sure that the patients are okay, which I think is absolutely fine, okay? Priority is patient safety, absolutely. Do, do you go and see the patients or do you maybe take the SHO with you? Uh, Samir has said, uh, speak to the SHO to know why. I think that's a good thing. Sit to the SHO and figure it out. If I have time, I will see. Fine. Okay. So I think, yeah, priorities are the SHO's behavior. And these are not listed in terms of how I would necessarily action them. I just kind of brainstorm these onto the slide and I've done that on purpose I've not put them in the order I would necessarily do them the red zone patients so the COVID patients are also a priority and also the senior nurse you kind of need to go and smooth things over with her or speak to her because you need to know what her feeling was and what exactly happened um, and it might be that she's dealing with something as well that's that's a bit stressful and a bit difficult um, has anyone got any thoughts as to the conversation with the SHO has anyone got any insight in terms of why do we think the SHO doesn't want to go and see these patients? I'm keeping my eye on the chat. I can't see anything at the moment. Um, it sounds like maybe he's worried that he may get the COVID himself. Yeah, absolutely. Do we know if our SHO has got, um, yeah, he's got his, has, have they got medical reasons? I'm saying he, he, she, the SHO may be concerned. They've got their own medical concerns and, they might be susceptible or vulnerable to catching COVID. Absolutely. Um, yeah, has medical or health issues. Absolutely. Um, so if we've not worked with this as SHO and we don't know about these sorts of things, then it's worth finding that sort of thing out. Um, but absolutely, we've got a kind of, so we'll structure our answer. We'll say that we do have to go and make sure the patients are assessed. So we go to the department, we speak to the nurse in charge. We see what the patients are and we see what the nurse, uh, we see what's happening with those and whether anything is done. And we, try to take the SHO with us. Um, now, if someone's really mean in the interview, they could say to you, go and speak to the SHO and they burst into tears. And then how do you deal with that? You still got to sit and chat with them, haven't you? You still got to talk out and find out what their concerns are. And it may be that they're not the most appropriate person to go and see uh, those patients. And you, maybe you find them something else to do. If you were doing reviews of patients on the ward, then maybe they go and review the patients on the ward and you see the COVID patients. And then you sit down with the SHO and you maybe have a cup of tea and you have a chat when you've got a bit of time on the night and you find out what their worries and their concerns are. 
yeah, our CSA chose to take a short break and then we'll speak later. Yeah, maybe that person, it's not a case of they don't want to see the COVID patients. Thank you, Salma. Maybe that person's been working for seven hours straight on a night shift. It's their fourth night shift and they've just had enough and they just want 10 minutes just to go and sit down and have a cup of tea. They weren't saying, no, I won't see the patients at all. They were saying, no, I need to just go and have a break. Because um, remember, there's always two sides of this. And the, the nurse may have said something to the patient and you know, a nurse may have said something to the SHO and kind of, you know, there's a bit of a row, a bit of a back and forth. And it's just there to go and smooth things okay so yeah actions assess the red, red zone patients conversation with the sho so why are they resisting what are their concerns and their fears you do have to address their rudeness if they were rude but it's difficult if it was a back and forth and he said she said if the nurse has said one thing and the sho said something else and ultimately it's kind of not for you to sort of assuage one's done wrong and one's done right it's maybe just mediate that and if you can take the SHO with you to go and see the patients and, you know, maybe they have a chat with the nurse as well at the same time, it might actually help things a bit. Okay. Does that seem reasonable to everyone? Is that the sort of information you'd be expecting or, or the sort of thing you'd be thinking about putting down? Yeah. The thing you don't do, and I'm going back to Homer Simpson again, Homer Simpson will pick up the phone. Um, <laughs> speak to each one separately, make them all NHS tea and toast. Sal, mate, you must work somewhere where you've got so much time on your hands to make everyone tea and toast in the middle of the night shift. <laughs> um, but it's a great idea and it does help. Just those little bits of kindness can really help. Um, but yeah, the, the, the wrong thing would be to pick the phone up to the SHO and scream at them down the phone to go and see the patients and not listen to them. OK, we're not we don't want you to say that in an interview. What we want you to say is we want you to say that, you know, you, you'll deal with things and you'll mediate and you'll try and help. OK. Yeah, absolutely. It's not possible in Queens. We're far too busy. Right. Um, I don't know if anyone's noticed as well, by the way, I've kind of got um, some fairly dramatic pictures for each of these cases. And it was kind of done on purpose. And this this picture, I think, typifies this situation. So this is a long one. You are the paediatric registrar on call in a busy DGH and you're taking handover for the night shift. You have two SHOs, one covering the paediatric ward and the other covering the neonatal unit. You are told at handover that there is an imminent delivery of a 28 weeker. There is also a 14 year old coming in by ambulance in DKA. The ED nurse in charge is also paged to tell you that there are four patients waiting to be seen in the waiting room and one of them has been waiting for almost three hours. You have three beds in the wards and no cubicle. The ward nurse interrupts and hand, hand over to let you know that two patients need weeds review for stretching. Your adult ED colleagues are very busy with the influx due to COVID and redeployment. How are you going to manage this situation? Okay. This is a long one, and this is definitely one that you would need to repeat back to make sure you picked up on the nuances, okay? Because, well, there's not really a nuance. It's, it's pretty in your face, the whole thing. <laughs> so have a minute. I'm just going to have a sip of my tea while you have a minute. Okay. So I'm going to try and repeat it back. I've not got it in front of me. So I'm the registrar on a night shift. I've got two SHOs. There's a 28 weeker that's going to be born. There's a 14 year old in DK that's on the way in an ambulance. Nurse in charge in ED says there's lots of patients to review, including some red and some wheezers. And the ED team are pretty busy with their own stuff and can't really help them. So, priorities. What are our priorities in this case? So, we've got <laughs> someone's actually put prioritizers in prioritize. Absolutely, we need to prioritize what's going to happen first. Someone, we've got Sam was saying reg for the preterm, DKA and 28 week are prioritized. Prioritize and call for help. Yeah, this is another new huh? Um, absolutely. Yep. DKA and 28 weeker. So they're at they're at headliners, aren't they? Definitely. But we've got other things going on as well. Um 28 week for delivery, the 14 year old in DKA, got patients in the waiting room, and we've also got the wheezers for review. Okay. Yeah, so we've got Fatima who's also saying, um, ask ED to see the DKA and I'll go to the preterm and let my consultant know. Uh, you know your SHO so you can delegate according to what you have. Yeah, and that's a really important thing as well, is knowing the capabilities of your staff. It's not just knowing you have two SHOs, 
what level are those SHOs? Have you got an ST3 and a foundation doctor um, or a GP ST1? Um, who is the current team and who, who can come consult on call? What's the other thing? We're at handover. We still have the day team. And it's a pretty rough thing to do. But when you get that sort of information coming at handover, you've still got another resource and you've got those people who are due to go home but maybe can hang around. Yeah, look for available staff to help. I get the impression from the way the scenario is given, there's probably not a NICU team. You probably it. The one registrar and two SHOs are all there is. But you might be lucky enough to have a, a NICU staff. It might be the 28 weekers coming into A&E, for example. And then have an idea of the urgency of the waiting patients. If they're waiting, they're waiting. And if they need wheeze reviews, they can probably wait a little bit longer. And if they need reviews, you could maybe just ask the nursing staff to give them some salbutamol and then you review them at the next interval. That might be the way to do it. Okay. So the actions. The first action for this scenario, and I've had scenarios like this. I've, I've worked at places where you're given this sort of thing in the middle of the night and you don't know what to do. First thing is not to panic. It's like answering the question. To take a breath and think about what you have in terms of resources. And then everyone else has said call for help, which I think is the most important thing. OK, the first person you're going to call is that person who's accountable, that person who's going to share your responsibility, and that's your consultant. OK, you call your consultant on call and you explain the situation to them. What's the first thing you're going to say to the consultant? And it's what I ask my registrar to say to me if they're calling me in the middle of the night and they want me. What, you, what do you say to them? Someone on microphone, someone in the chat, come on. Yes, I need you urgently. I need you to come in, okay? It's not a, this is a situation, I think things are really bad. It's, we're struggling, please help. Yeah, absolutely. That's the first thing. You need to make it very clear to your consultant you need them to come in. Yeah, good. Have we got a NICU? Have we got extra hands? ED, have they got extra hands? Now, it might be the ED doctor. Oh, someone said, why transport services? They've read all the way to the bottom. So. Um, I've worked in some places, there are some hospitals where if there is an extreme preterm baby coming in and there is a problem with staffing or you're, you're struggling, you can contact your local, um, your local NICU that's got a transport service, depending on where you work in the UK, um, and say to them, we've got this 28 week coming in and they can be en route. Yeah, you're in a DGH and you've got a 28 week out. You might need a transport service on the way straight away. It might be they don't need to take, but we don't know. The question has not said anything about your NICU or SCABU capability. We don't know if we've got a level one unit, a level two unit. We don't know if we've got a NICU at all. It might be that it's a mum who's going to come in and deliver and recess, in, in which case you're going to need someone to come and take this child to a, a special care baby unit or a neonatal intensive care unit, aren't you? Um, but you need to look around for the capability that you've got and the help that you have. But calling for help is the most important thing. You need your consultant and you need anyone else that can help you. You know. Do you have advanced nurse practitioners that can help? Do you have a clinical site practitioner like we do at Queen's who can kind of help fill in some of those roles and help you? Because, you know, the DKA might not need a registrar and two SHOs. It might just need an SHO to start things rolling when they come in. Um, because, you know, DKA for the most part, if they're not awful, they just need a bit of fluid resuscitation. That can kind of be done over the telephone. You can have your SHO down there and they can be seeing the patient and they can be talking to you about what they want to do next. Um, and, you know, 28 week at imminent delivery could be in the next hour, two hours, three hours. So it's important to find out when that baby's actually going to drop. Because, um, you know, we know what it's like when you work covering NICUs and stuff. Everyone gets worried and upset and concerned and, you know, nervous about this baby coming. Actually, mum's not fully dilated yet and she's not going to arrive for another hour or two. And actually, you've got a good amount of time to go and sort out that DKA, maybe sort out ED a little bit so that, you know, everyone leaves you alone a bit. Um, but maybe asking the day team to stay as well is a useful thing to do. All right. Has anyone ever dealt with a scenario that's similar to this or had a night shift like this? Yeah. Nua's nodding. I know she has because she's worked at Queens. Yeah, she has. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. Draw on your experience. Because um, it's, it's good to be able to answer this scenario. But if you can say but I've also worked in this place and what we did was this. Um, yeah, and it happens in different ways, absolutely. And so what you have at your unit is different from what other people have. Some people are resource rich, some people are resource poor, and you just have to speak from your own experience in what you do. Um, but, you know, in an ideal situation, you know, put out all the possibilities of things that might exist that might be able to help you. 
based on all the places you've worked, not just the one place you're currently working. Okay. And um, if anyone's got time to make tea and toast, then they can do that as well, because you're going to need it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where can I say I need to finish the handover? Um, yeah, I, I think that's not a bad idea. Is actually is 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 how you how are you going to finish the handover? Do you maybe leave an SHO to take the rest of the handover from the day team? Do you leave an SHO from the day team to hand over to the night SHO? And you know, you and the other reg are on the day go and sort of handle some of these scenarios. That might be the way to do it. Um, and I put down here explain your priorities to others. It's important to kind of explain to the nurse in ED, we've got a 28 week and we've got a DKA. I need to deal with those before I come and see your visas. And actually that might just be the nurse in charge of that. No, absolutely. I understand. We'll make, we'll see what we can do. And actually your nurse in charge in ED might be able to speak to ED doctors or other people to kind of help sort of get a little bit more um, support for you. There's, there'll be an ED consultant. It won't just be ED juniors, remember, all that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, number three, you are the paediatric registrar on the night shift seeing patients in ED. The ward nurse in charge calls you to inform you that a two week old baby who's currently being treated for sepsis has received an incorrect dose of gentamicin. The dose was prescribed by the SHO following checking the result of the gentamicin level. She informs you that the patient has been given double the dose he should have. How are you going to manage this situation? Actually, I'll go back and let you read it. I keep taking it away so you not have a chance. So have a look at that and then we'll think about what you're going to do. <laughs> Sam has got the idea already. No panic, patient safety. Patient safety, another one as well, yeah. But I, I want specifics. Yeah. That's a good answer, Guida. Is it Guida? I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Check the baby. Talk to parents. Yep. Yeah. Assess the baby. Good. Take bloods. Yeah. Absolutely. Duty of candor. Well done, Fad. Thank you. Talk to a parent and do a huddle to know why. That's that's a really nice suggestion, actually. So get the heads around the table and just have a look and see. And thank you, Fatima, for saying instant report. Good. So some really nice suggestions there, both in terms of priorities and um, actions to do as well. Okay. Because the other, the other end of the day as well is we don't necessarily know what has completely happened here. Um, it may be that this is completely correct. Um, document and put plan for follow up. Yeah, that's great. That would be the last thing we'd be doing, but that's a really good way. Yeah. So, uh, for some reason, I didn't put my animations on this one. Okay. So, priorities in this one are the patient, the mistake, the SHO, and duty of candor. Okay. There are other priorities as well, and I think and reflect as well. And um, certainly, the SHO is going to have to reflect and learn. So, I think we need to verify the mistake first. We need to look and see if there has been a mistake and how significant the mistake is. And then we need to check the patient. So with gentamicin, we're gonna to have to make sure we check a level at an appropriate time, not check a level straight away, because it may be that that's not actually gonna be relevant. We need to check the level when it's supposed to be checked and see how bad uh, the potential overdose may be. Um, and we're obviously gonna to need to check about things like side effects. So we're gonna to have to look at the renal function, all that sort of thing as well, to see if there's been any impact on that. We are going to have to speak to the family and this is not something you leave for the daytime okay this is something that you should speak to um the family almost as soon as you realize it's happened okay i wouldn't send the sho to go and do this i don't think it's fair to the sho and i don't think it's fair to the family i think the, reg the sho could go with the registrar for their learning purposes to hear what's going to be said um but i don't think it's necessary that they be there and it may actually actually be upsetting for the family and the SHO and um, to be present for that conversation. Um, documentation included in incident form, really important. You need to document what's happened. So you need to write a, uh, a summary of uh, what dose was given, why it was given, um, date and time, everything. 
you need to complete an incident form because this sort of thing always needs to have an incident form. And part of completing that, it will ask you whether you've done a duty of candor. And duty of candor is that honest ad admission to the parents that there has been a mistake or there has been an error, but it's not an apology. You're not saying, or you're not sending the SHO to say sorry for what they've done. You're going to them and saying, there has been an error. Um, your child has been given an incorrect dose of a medication. Um, it appears there was a miscalculation. We will look at why that's happened. You explain to them the potential risk to their child. You explain what you're going to do about that potential risk to their child. Um, and then what the follow-up is going to be. And you can get just about every reaction under the sun to this conversation. I've had angry, I've had crying, I've had sometimes the most surprising but the nicest to have is completely understanding and um just wanting to find out what's going to happen next and willing to work with you okay because everyone really worries they're going to go and speak to families and say there's been an error and the first thing they're going to do is scream and shout at you okay it's not often the case and it's not always the case okay um but that shouldn't stop you from going and having that conversation as a registrar as, as a um it's 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 an important thing for you to learn how to do is to have these very frank conversations um and it's not a get out and it's not being um snaky or snidey um you're not apologizing for having done it you are simply saying we're sorry there has been an error which is different okay um and you do you're as open and as honest as possible with a family you don't try and conceal anything um because they'll know if you, you're trying to do that um and if they ask you questions answer them honestly and if you don't know the answers be honest that you don't know the answers okay and offer them the ability for them to take action if they say they want to complain give them the means of doing so okay because that's a very easy way to diffuse conflict over that um if you sort of you're argumentative or standoffish about that and say well fine complain then that is only ever going to upset them more and make them want to complain more um what i would do is, is actually say that's fine you are well within your rights to and i completely understand your need to want to complain um and offer them um i don't know what the organization's called at each trust but and i trust it's pals which is the patient advice liaison service give them the contact details for pals tell them where the pals office is um and they can go and they can air their grievances there and that's absolutely fine um and then inform your senior for this sort of thing i wouldn't necessarily unless you're concerned there's been significant harm to the patient i wouldn't necessarily go straight to phoning the consultant in the middle of the night but you do need to let the responsible consultant know um because if they're on an incident if they're named on an incident form or if they're there's going to have to be some sort of investigation about this and they didn't know about it on their own call um then it's just a professional courtesy to let them know um but if you're unsure or if the family are particularly difficult um or if there's some other you know the the SHO is very upset or anything else then I think it's worth speaking to the consultant to let them know it's happened and you're not telling tales you're not making sure someone's being told off you're just sharing that responsibility you're letting the accountable person know that there has been an error um during their time that they're accountable for this patient is that okay um I would verify the mistake first um is it Micah or Mika, um, I would definitely make sure you know there's been a mistake before you then go and speak to the family. Because the last thing you want to do is go and have this very heavy conversation or potentially heavy conversation <coughs> with the family um, for them to then for them go back and say, actually, there wasn't a mistake in the first place. Your baby's had the right dose and there's no problem. OK, so make sure you verify the mistake first. And that shouldn't really take much to do. You're welcome. Any other questions about that at all? Um, may I ask directly, please? Um, Sorry, what was that? Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking. It's like how the scenario will run in the interview. Uh, would we expect that? It's like let's say I'm I'm saying I'm I'm speaking, so they will fill me with more information, or just what it has how, what the what the scenario from the beginning, and there is no more information. Do they expect me to to say all what you have said? It's like I'm verifying my I verify the mistake first. Then it's like I check the patients. Then they will tell me what what the patient situations or or how it will flow during the interview. 
yeah i think i think mostly they will just give you the scenario and expect you to give an approach so a lot of this is about approach and the things that you would look at doing um, they won't walk you through it necessarily like it's a clinical scenario. So they won't say to you, so you've gone to go and check and actually, yes, there definitely has been a mistake. Um, what they want to know is that you have a structured approach to this sort of situation and how you deal with it. Um, so the actions I've put, so verifying the mistake, um, checking the patient, speaking with the family, documentation, including incident form, and then informing your consultant. These, I think, are the necessary things you need to do and should be your approach to this sort of thing. Um, there's not really a lot of point of them giving you the scenario and actually there's not a mistake because you say, well, I'll go to check there's a mistake. There's no mistake. So I don't really need to take any further action. Um, so the expectation is there probably has been a mistake, but we expect you to walk through each of the things that you would do like any of these. Um, they won't generally make the situation a fluid one, one that changes as you go along or give you more information. They expect you to take the information you have and give the plan that you formulate in your head before you're going to go there. Does that make it clearer? Yes, that's very clear. Thank you very much. That's all right. I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear at the outset. So scenario four. Um, I went with a happy person for a change because I kind of got sick of having people that look really unhappy on these pictures. So I've gone with someone who looks cheerful, even though the scenario is probably not one of the most cheerful ones. Um, you're one of the registrars on a busy paediatric ward and you notice one of your registrar colleagues is repeatedly coming late to work. You also notice that their documentation has become up suboptimal and that they've made some prescribing errors. They do not go to the canteen for lunch with the team or socialize after work as they used to do previously. Um, and it goes without saying, how would you handle this situation? And I'll give you guys a minute just to sort of read and absorb that and sort of give me some ideas of how you deal with it. Okay, so uh, see, I've got my priorities up here. Unfortunately, I've not put my animations in, and I apologise for that. So, um, approaching for a talk, patient safety, colleague health. Yep, I think they're up there. But I'd welcome any if anyone's got any more suggestions. So, I think the key thing is is they're pushing colleague welfare here. There's a person who is unhappy unwell has got something else going on in their life but there is a clinical aspect to this and this person has been committing prescribing errors yep thank you fatima try to invite him for a cup of tea to talk to him absolutely what's not clear in this situation lots of people having tea and coffee with this registrar i think it's a good idea patient safety talk and involve consultant yeah You've got prescribing errors here and it's not clear in the scenario as to whether the prescribing errors are just ones that you've noticed and you've dealt with or whether these are prescribing errors that have been picked up on a wider governance scale and have been dealt with on that scale that's not covered okay and uh, as Shiraz was asking is 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 the expectation going to be you're going to be given more information no and salma's laying down the law patient's not safe it's more than just talk yeah so i think it does need escalating yeah you've got a colleague here who is unhappy for various reasons got other things going on but there have been prescribing errors okay and if you are the only person that has picked up on these or you and your colleagues have picked up on them but they've not been taken further it really does need to be taken on maybe to the next step and speak to someone okay because there have been prescribing errors that have been dealt with if there's a dangerous prescribing error then that could be a really big issue especially if you're aware of it minimum on a personal level you're going to feel fairly guilty that you knew something was wrong and maybe didn't take some action he needs to take annual leave and occupational health consultant involvement yeah these are all really great suggestions and the way you'd structure this is is you firstly deal with the prescribing errors and talk about them and outline all the things everyone said that patient safety is a priority and if there are prescribing errors they need to be escalated okay and it may be you're given a bit more information than say okay you've, you've dealt with the um, or the prescribing errors have all been dealt with already. There's no concerns about those. He's maybe gone on a prescribing <coughs> course or he's had a prescribing assessment and his prescribing is now felt to be safe. But you do still have this doctor's welfare, okay? But I think at the end of the day, you've got to approach it. Oh, sorry, new educational supervisor. Um, oh, so that, five that minutes left. Educational, sorry? 
Five minutes left. Oh, blimey, I've got a rush. Okay. Um, educational supervisor or clinical supervisor. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if they don't give you any more information about what the scenario is, say you're going to deal with it from a prescribing error point of view and that that does need escalating, you need to speak to this person's supervisor at the end of the day or the uh, responsible consultant. You need to outline that you're worried about this person. But there is no harm in going to speak to this person as well. Okay. Um, it's important because. <laughs> assess maybe before you go and speak to a consultant is assessing that person's insight or awareness are they aware of how they're presenting themselves at work are they aware um that they are um withdrawn are they aware that they're behaving differently um it might be that this person has got some terrible personal issues they're dealing with they've had a family bereavement they're separated from their partner they've got unwell children at home work has got on top of them they're dealing with something but do you need to report him? You need to speak to their educational supervisor, I think is what you need to do. Um, you need to speak to the person who's ultimately accountable for this person's training or, or how they're supervised at work. Um, and you need to talk about your concerns and the issues you have um, and approach it in that way. You're not telling tales. Patient safety is the priority and say that you've noticed as a result of all these things on top of the behavior, there have been some prescribing errors because if no one else is aware, then maybe that needs to be highlighted. Um, you ideally shouldn't cover for colleagues if you notice there are errors in their working okay um it's about addressing those there if you're supervising someone and you notice errors it's for you as the supervising registrar to talk to them about them and again escalate if there's no insight on that person's part or there's no you know they don't grasp what they should be doing and everything else okay um so patient safety is key is a takeaway from this one but there is a colleague here who needs some support and it's about either helping them to navigate that and get that support or speaking to someone senior to make sure they get that support, okay? It might be they need to take some time. It might be they need to speak to occupational health, but it's not for you to do. It's for you to speak to someone who can actually help deal with that, okay? Um, fine, we've got one more scenario that I'll try and be as quick as I can. You're the pediatric registrar on a night shift and busy in the emergency department. Your SHO called you very distressed and crying, telling you that they've sustained a needle stick injury while taking blood from one of the patients on the ward. How would you approach this? Okay, so I'm gonna move on. I'm hoping I've done my animations. I have, okay. So some quick suggestions in the chat about how you deal with this and some priorities in this situation. Do I need to go back? No, yep good so salmon straight in asking the SHO to wash their hands and uh, don't stop bleeding calm the SHO go for a short break occupational health thank you Dipti report it calm down squeeze under running water and report good follow the protocol occupational health excellent um Someone gets brownie points if they can put in the chat. If this is in the night, um, what's the alternative to occupational health or what do you do? Because during the day you send them to occupational health and another night, what do you do? Thank you, ED, lovely. Thank you very much. What's <clears throat> the potential thing they need to go to ED for? Well, the couple of things they need to go to ED for. Yep. So they need to be registered as a patient because then they're going to need to have bloods done. What else might they need? Wound management. If this child's mother is HIV positive, what might they need? Yeah, immunization is a good suggestion as well. Hep B. Does everyone know what PrEP is? So they might, need pro, they might need prophylaxis. If there's a potential risk for HIV, then they might need prophylaxis as well. And that's <coughs> really um, ED, um, yeah, ED um, or occupational health, the only places they're going to get that. So actions, um, first aid, you've all said about the first aid, which is good because this SHO is panicking um, and it may be just making sure they've managed the wounds properly in the first place to minimise their risk. Assess the risk and deal with the injury. Um, You've still got to do duty of candor in this situation. There still is a patient involved, okay? 
And it depends on the needle stick injury. It may not just be the patient who's at risk. Okay, if they've through and through their own finger, which does happen, the needle's gone all the way through them and into the patient, um, then actually the doctor may be at less risk than the patient is, potentially, in terms of who's injured who, all right? And that needs to be understood. And you're also going to need to do duty of candor because you need to make sure you've got permission to test the patient. Because knowing what the patient's risk is, how it gives you some idea of what the risk is to the professional, Okay. So you do still need to go and speak to the family. You do still need to let them know what's happened. And you do apologize that there has been an error. So it's the same procedure again. Um, you're honest, you're open. And again, if they want to complain, if they're upset, it's worth taking someone else with you. And I didn't say that in the previous situation, but actually it's worth taking the nurse or midwife in charge of these sorts of situation as someone who's going to continue to be present after you've gone. And also someone who can generally help sort of smooth things over and just... Um, help to calm people down once you've left because you're going to have other things you're going to go and do. You're not going to be able to spend all night or all day with these patients, okay? Yeah, thank you, William. Time's up. Thank you. Um, I think I've got one more scenario and I'll finish. And then occupational health and then out of hours, again, send the, the SHO to ED. Um, another action is, is obviously if you lose your SHO, you're going to have to shovel your, shuffle your workload and make sure you're covering everything else. Uh, and then documentation, we need to do an instant form as well. Okay, <clears throat> so we need to document in the notes and we need to do an instant form. Um, and then the last question that I have to answer, and I do apologize for running over. Can you tell us about quality improvement project you have led or were a part of the impact, sorry, you have led or were part of and the impact it had on your department? Okay, um, and I'm just gonna answer this because I think it's just good to give you an idea of how to structure this or at least give, an, give some things you should be making sure you address when you answer this question okay so the question about quality improvement project it's not just tell us about your audit you've done okay that doesn't give us all the information that doesn't give us the impression that you know all about your leadership and governance it doesn't give us the impression that you know about the governance structures within the nhs and within your trust okay we need to know a little bit more than the audit you've done and the number of patients you looked at um, and you know how you assess the data and did you use Excel or something else okay so what is the question asking is awareness of what a quality improvement project is and that you've actually participated in one because the other thing we need to do um, is we need to know that you actually participated in one because it's important for your training to have participated in quality improvement as you go along you need to understand what the triggers are so it's not just I was asked by my consultants to do this audit it's there was an instant form put in about whatever patient. I'll give you an example. Um, we had a serious incident at um, the HRUT where there were, actually there were two incidents and that's why there was a quality improvement that came out of it. Two patients who received IVA cyclovir um, at a higher than they should have received dose. And that's partly because the information on how to prescribe it is sometimes confusing. Um, these patients weren't also adequately hydrated and as a result, they received reversible acute kidney injuries, okay? So as a result of those two instant forms being put in, there were SI investigations about those. As a result of the SIs, there was action plans put in place and there was some quality improvement work that was done as a result, okay? If you can give that sort of answer about it, it demonstrates that you're aware of kind of the wider scope of what quality improvement and what governance is, not just you know how to do an audit, okay? And I think that's really important is to talk about what actually caused it to come into being in the first place. Understanding the governance structure and procedures. Uh, sorry, an SI is a serious incident. So that is when um, an incident reaches a certain threshold, when there is a anticipated <laughs> level of patient harm, um, it's classed as a serious incident and it is investigated in a certain way, uh, Micah. So uh, we make sure that we do a full investigation, we get witness statements, there's a timeline. Um, and as a result of that investigation, we decide um, if there are any other sort of actions that need to take place. But understanding the governance structure and procedures, knowing what um, what an SI is, knowing what a red incident is, um, knowing how these things are investigated and what's done. Um, so it's important to sort of have an idea um, of what has underlied the uh, QIP being instigated. Um, and then the other thing to say as well is about closing the loop on the quality improvement project. So you've done your audit, you found out how many patients have got this or done this. 
what did you do as a result of that quality improvement? So did you bring in a change? What was that change? And then did you see if that change actually made a difference? So closing the audit loop um, and uh, making sure that that is followed up either by yourself or that there are plans in place for someone else to do it yearly. And that lets us know you understand what governance is, what the leadership is in that situation um, and your awareness of that. Um, and if you can answer that fairly robustly, um, that will stand you in good stead. OK, um, thank you very much. I'm very sorry I've run over time. Has anyone got any more questions they want to ask me at all? Thank you very much, William, for this lovely and uh, useful talk. You're welcome. Thank you. I think you answered can I, all can the just questions. just quickly so. ask a question about sure. just the... Can I just quickly ask a question about the needle stick injury? Yes. Um, if I'm seeing patients in the ED, I'm seeing emergencies. So isn't that a priority over tending to the patient with the needle stick injury? Sorry, the SHO with the needle stick injury. So welcome to being a registrar. That's what I would say. Um, it's a priority for you to do certain things if you are in the middle of a resus situation you absolutely do not leave that resus to go and deal with this situation um but we have to know what you're going to do to deal with it in the fullness of time and we have to know you've got a plan in place the immediate things are first aid as everyone has said and then making sure that sho has gone to go and sort themselves out from the needle stick so you need to know what the sho has done if they tell you they've injured the patient as well then that you are going to have to at some point go and deal with that and it might be that you, I don't know, if there's another registrar working with you, if there's another SHO, maybe they can go and speak to the family, especially if they're a bit more experienced, they're an ST3, something like that, or an ST2. Um, you don't go with it immediately, and that would be a demonstrate maturity in your answer if you said, if I was in the middle of a resource situation, I wouldn't obviously leave, but if I was able to go and leave the ED department to go and deal with this, then I would. It may be you call in some support. It might be to go and deal with this. You have to call your consultant um, because if that needs to be dealt with, then you are going to need to sort of, you know, go and break out um, or just explain to the nurses in ED that, you know, the second or third wheezer that you've had to see that night is going to have to wait an extra half an hour just while you go and quickly do this conversation, quickly go and assess and make sure the SHO is OK and get them to ED and get them sorting things out. Because um, actually the quicker you get them sorted out and the quicker they've had their bloods done and they've had their injury dealt with and everything, hopefully the quicker they're able to return back to work and support. If that person is so upset and so distraught they can't return to work, then actually you might need your consultant's help because you're going to be down on SHO for the rest of the night. And that's part of the structure of answering the question, I think. Does that answer it for you a bit better? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? I can see you've got my colleague Katie Ruck next. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you and I hope it's been helpful. I will send my slides on if anyone feels that they will be helpful to have. Thank you very much, William, uh, for this lovely talk. Uh, so uh, for the next uh, session, it's about communication. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kate Rook, uh, a newly qualified pediatrician consultant working at, Queen, working at Queen's Hospital, Cranford. Uh, qualified from the University of Birmingham uh, and undertake a foundation year uh, there, uh, completed pediatric run-through run training in Northeast London area, particularly enjoying working in area of ethnic and cultural diversity with a wide range of uh, uh, background of pathology, particular interest in general pediatric uh, and child protection. Welcome, Kate. Hi. Good morning, thanks for that introduction and for having me today. Um, so I got a new computer yesterday because my one broke. So hopefully this is all gonna work and go to plan. But um, let me share the screen.
Dr. Katie, you're mute. Fab, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, yes. And can you see the slides moving? Yes, we can. Fab, okay. So not the best start to the communication lecture, but um, so today I've been asked to talk about communication. Um, and so in terms of why it's important, obviously we all need communication to function both personally and professionally. Um, but for all of you guys, um, it's important both for your application process and the interview itself. So I've just taken the person specification. So the criteria that's required when you apply for training, and this is available on the Royal College website. Um, and as you can see, part of the essential criteria is to do with language and communication. And again, the application guidance, which is available on the Royal College website, um, talks about the communication scenario in the interview. So I know this is a, a bit of a wordy slide, but basically you're given a scenario where you have to interact with either a patient, a parent or a carer or a colleague, and they're judging communication and knowledge base. Um, and finally, hopefully something that you all experience by the end of this process, um, the Royal College has a curriculum where there are 11 areas, 11 domains, and one of them is specific to communication because that's how important it is both to develop relationships with patients, with colleagues, um, and it's important to recognise it comes in a variety of forms. So in terms of the presentation today, I thought I'd focus first on the application um, and then on the interview itself. So in terms of the application, I just quickly wanted to go through some top tips to use when you're answering the written questions, and then also to go through structures, um, which could be used not only for the written application, but for the interview itself. So the first top tip when you're answering the written questions is to avoid any lengthy introductions. So if we look at an example of that, say the question is, what has been your involvement in clinical governance? You don't need to introduce the question by rephrasing it. Um, you don't need to explain what clinical governance is, um, but you need to be more direct with your answer. So instead of going through rewriting the question as your answer, you know, be direct, go through chronologically, say that as a junior, you were involved to, with audit and day-to-day -day risk management, but as the years progress, you've taken part in larger projects, whatever they may be. So the first point is about avoiding lengthy introductions and answering the question directly. The next thing I'd say is that I know typically pediatricians aren't good at this um, because I do think we're humble, modest, a humble, modest group, but you do need to use language to sell yourself. So if we just look at a couple of examples of that, if you write, I'd be happy to play a role in teaching, you know, for me that says, if you ask me nicely, I'll do it if I have to. But instead of saying you'd be happy to play a role in teaching, be assertive, use more action words. So you've developed a strong interest in teaching. You're keen to take on a more prominent role. So another example of using language to sell yourself. So in this example, instead of saying you're lucky to be involved in an audit, you know, that implies that you didn't choose to do it, but you relied on others to give you the opportunity. Um, instead, again, be more assertive, use your action words so you played a key role in managing audit projects. So moving on with the top tips, whenever you're asked um, for your written answers to, uh, for, you know, a characteristic, you want to always back it up with an example. So if you're asked, what are your main strengths? You can see that here, writing, you're approachable, supportive, dedicated. Whilst that may be true, it's not factual. It, there's nothing personal about it. So instead, you want to include an example. Um, so for instance, junior colleagues commented in your multi-source feedback that you're committed to education. So in including feedback, it adds credibility to your answer. Um, and then providing an example you know, you organized after hours teaching, you ensured they were involved in activities which would benefit them later in their career. So just always think back up with an example. And it's often good in answers to include feedback that you've received to add credibility to what you're saying. So 
those were the top tips. Um, and if there's one thing you take away from this, which is true both of your written answers in your application and in your interview, whatever it is that you're asked, is structure. So always have a structure, not just because that helps to make what you're saying easier to digest, it also gives you something to fall back on. So if like me, you were terrified and all you can feel is the heart in your throat, then having a structure just helps to calm the situation, gives you something to fall back on. So when I say structure, it's about having three or four main points. You know, you could probably talk all day for to answer some of the questions, but you just want to headline three or four main points, go on into them in more detail and then give a concluding remark. So, for instance, if you were asked, tell us about your teaching experience, you know, I'm sure all of you could go on and on about all the different types of teaching that you've done, but you want to structure it. Think about some main points. So you could order it in terms of the training you've had in teaching, whether you've been on a teaching course, then you say you, you've used those skills to do both undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. You can give examples. And then again, saying that you've received positive feedback to so adding credibility to your answer um, and then can give a concluding remark about, you know, I would like to use my teaching skills to uh, fulfill the obligations of the post you're applying for. Um, so when it comes to structure, there are acronyms that can help. Um, I'm afraid I can't see the screen. So if anyone has questions, please do ask or interrupt me. But um, I don't know if these are something you've come across before, whether I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but I think it's important to go back to the basics when it comes to communication so that it really can be effective. You can get your point across. So the first structure is CAMP. So this acronym can be used in questions where they're asking you to tell, tell them about yourself, talk you through the CV. So each letter stands for a topic that you could talk about. So clinical, academic, management, personal. But if we look at an example of tell me about yourself, for the clinical side of things, you can talk about the clinical experience. And I'm sure all of you have a wealth of clinical experience. So talk about what's most relevant to the post you're applying for. Um, in terms of academic, you then go on to talk about teaching, any possible research you've been involved with. And then management, you can talk about your day-to-day -day management, so handling a team, handovers, um, and then go on to higher level kind of clinical governance or quality improvement projects you've done to develop a service. And then personal, go into your hobbies and personal attributes. So it's just having a structure to cut out any waffle, get your point across, and then conclude it again, just to round off the answer and um, say, in conclusion or in summary, um, I had the skills to fulfill the uh, specifications of the job. So that was CAMP. There's another structure, which I don't know if you guys know about, STAR. So STAR can be used whenever they're asking you to give a situation of something, give an example of a situation where you showed leadership, for instance, or where you had to resolve conflict. So situation, is about the context of the story. The task is, is what you were hoping to achieve, action, what you did. And then an important part is the result and reflection. So what happened? What did you learn? How is it going to change things in future? So if we look at an example of describing a situation when you dealt with a difficult patient, we set the context. So how the situation came about, how did you end up encountering this difficult person? You then say, my task was to de-escalate the tension. Um, the reason I put action in bold is because perhaps this is the most important point. An interviewer wants to see um, what you did to handle the situation. So how you communicated effectively, who else you involved, and then how you dealt with the frustration that the incident caused. Um, and another important part, again, the result and reflection. So what was the outcome? Um, how is that going to change how you practice? So an example could be the patient didn't end up complaining. He was happy he felt listened to. So that shows you something as simple as active listening can help to uh, resolve conflict. So finally, the third structure is spies. So it's about seeking information, um, 
making sure the patient's safety hasn't been compromised. It's your initiative, so what are you going to do about it? Escalating and support. So I think Bill's probably already dealt with this, so I won't go into it in a lot of detail, but the SPI structure can be used for um, when you're answering questions about dealing with difficult or problem doctors, so trainees in difficulty. So an example would be if an SHO repeatedly came in an hour late every day, um, you want to seek information. Is this actually a problem? Are they late or is there another colleague who's got a grudge against the SHO giving you false information? You want to see, has patient care been compromised in any way? The initiative, what are you gonna do about it? So are you going to increase the level of supervision? Um, Certainly, are you going to escalate it? And if so, to who? So particularly if patient safety was compromised by the SHO coming in late, um, not going to handover, not knowing about the patient, not completing the plan, are you going to escalate to the senior colleague? And as I'm sure Bill's talked about, how are you going to support that colleague? So are you going to arrange a follow-up meeting? Are you going to direct them to occupational health? So... That was, in terms of the written application, just some top tips to remember and also the structure to use to get your point across. But the main thing is get your application checked. So get it checked by your non-medical friends and family and by medical colleagues. Um, because when you read it a thousand times before you send it off, you start reading what you want to, perhaps, instead of what's actually on the piece of paper. Um, so before I then go into communication with regards to the interview, does anyone have any questions? Just because I can't see your faces on the screen. No, we okay? Fab. Um, so if we then talk about um, the interview, so again, just talking about general points, and then some communication scenarios. So just to make sure, can everyone still hear me and see my slides moving? Yes, yes. Fab. So I do want to say a caveat here. Um, so the first thing is, ordinarily, I would like to make presentations a lot more interactive, but it's, it's just slightly difficult um, with it being such a large group. Um, the other thing is, the slides which I've done, there are a lot of them. Now, my bugbear is when you go to a presentation and the presenter hasn't stuck to time, um, has ignored the time limit and is trying to fit through 100 slides in a session. Um, I will be skipping through some slides, but the reason I've included them is because I do think there's important information with regards to the communication scenario. So useful phrases um, that I know this is being recorded, the slides will be available that I wanted to give you something to go back to, which you can use as a, a basis for practice. So I will whiz through some of the slides. Um, the information is important, but we don't need to cover all of it now because there's limited time and because it's probably a bit of repetition from what Bill said and what you might hear for the rest of the day. So before we start talking about how you're going to approach communication in the interview, I just wanted to put the mark scheme for our membership exams. And you can see that it talks about the conduct of the assessment and your appropriate explanation. So that's basically communication. But it also talks about um, what you're communicating, so your knowledge base. It goes further. And again, this is something that's available on the Royal College website. You just type in communication or interview and it goes on further. And I think it's helpful always to look at mark schemes, whatever level you're applying for, because it helps you tailor your approach, tailor what you're going to say. So I've just shown in the red boxes some things that you want to think about when you're approaching communication. So it's both verbal and it's nonverbal. And it's about what you're saying. So the main thing is don't make things up. If you're not sure, it's no reason to panic. Um, you're not supposed to know everything, um, particularly not at ST1 level or ST3 and 4, even at consultant level, you're not supposed to know everything. But if there is something you don't know, don't stress about it. You just say, um, it's an interesting question. I'm going to go away and look, you know, say where you're going to look, consult with um, local guidelines, national guidelines, speak to a, a specialist colleague in the area, 
and I will arrange to get back to you about that. And that can still score you points, even though you're not entirely sure what you're going to say. So before you think about how you're going to communicate, you need to think, what is it you're communicating? And again, something that's available on the Royal College website, this is um, a guideline for how to write your scenarios for interviews. Um, and basically, there are three main points to take away. When you get your scenario, you've got to think, what is the task? What's your role in the task? And where is the location? Because that's going to tailor um, what you're going to say, the resources you have around you. Um, and in addition to thinking about what you're going to say, this is a framework to use for every single um, every single interview question. So as long as you know this, you will be fine. And again, it gives you something to fall back on that when you were terrified and all you can think about is how much your, your palms are sweating, you've got something to fall back on um, to get through the fear and actually say something that's going to make sense and score you points. Um, so just going through this, introducing yourself in the task. Yes, it's simple, but do not forget it. Um, whilst you've read the role that you're supposed to play, you still need to let the role player know or the interview panel know who you are, say what you're going to do. The next thing you want to do is ask, you know, what do you know about this already? Gauge whoever it is you're talking to, gauge their level of understanding because that's going to affect what you're going to say. Um, the next thing, um, the ICE cubes are just to remind you about the acronym of ICE. So what is it that that parent or that patient wants to know? So what are their ideas? So that's the I, what are their concerns? So what's worrying them the most? And what are their expectations? And again, that helps you tailor what it is you're going to say. And with these scenarios, they shouldn't normally be taken at face value. You know, they, they often not want to trick you, but there's that hidden agenda. You want to get to the bottom of what is it that the parents worried about here? Um, and say what you're going to tell them before you actually tell them and then check an understanding. So in these boxes, um, you don't have to read them now, but they're just useful phrases to learn, um, which hopefully will score you the points. So in terms of checking understanding, you show empathy and say, you know, you know, you've bombarded them with a lot of difficult information. Is it possible you can repeat back to me what I've said so I can check your understanding? Um, these may seem false and contrived, but it is so important to go through every point in this framework with your interview questions um, so that you can score the marks and hopefully in practicing them, whether it's to yourself in front of the mirror or whether you've got a study group, hopefully it becomes and sounds more natural. Um, just going to the bottom of the framework, always ask if anyone has any questions and a nice way of concluding it so you don't feel like you've just left people hanging is by signposting. So um, say where they're able to get more information or if it's, for instance, a new diagnosis, you're counseling parents about a heart murmur in a, a newborn, safety net them with the signs they need to look out for of when they should seek medical attention. So I would actually say I could probably finish there in terms of the top tips for the written application structures you're gonna use, and then for your interview, thinking about what you're going to say and using this framework about how you're going to say it. Um, but I did want to include some scenarios about um, the possible communication scenarios, which they're all basically the same topics that are used, phrased in different ways. So this is what I was talking about here that I'm in the next 10 minutes. I'm just going to go through some of the examples. Now, I have included a lot of slides. I will go through them all without saying everything that's on them, but I wanted to include them so that you can go back to them for reference um, and look at ideas of what you can say. So um, when it comes to the interview, your communication is either going to be about a patient, parent or carer, or it's going to involve a colleague. So I just wanted to put in here um, the main topics that are always included. So it's a new diagnosis, talking to a patient or parent about a treatment management plan, breaking some form of bad news, addressing a medical error or managing conflict. And I know already there's been some overlap with what Bill's written. Um, but just generally with these scenarios, I wanted some top tips. So 
if it involves a newborn baby, please congratulate the parents. Um, you know, I think that helps to build a rapport, set a scene. Um, if a name of a child is mentioned, please use the name of the child if you can. I know it's terrifying and you've got so many things to think about, but using the name of a child is another important thing, which I think just personalizes the situation, helps to build that rapport and prevent any escalation. And whilst I'm saying this, you know, for the purpose of your application and interviews, it really is something important to, to take away in practice as well, that try and use um, a baby's name. The other thing is um, no medical jargon. If it's a role play involving patients or parents or carers. Um, and the other important thing to remember is that if a baby is well, please start off by reassuring the parents that the baby is well, particularly with a new diagnosis, say something like uh, Down syndrome. You know, if the baby is well and not in cardiac failure from a associated congenital heart disease, then please do congratulate the parents, say the baby's well, reassure them, and then say there's things you need to talk about. So with any of these scenarios, fall back on your framework. As I said, I'm just going to pick out the important things to talk about. A lot of these slides, like this one, um, is just for you to go back to so that you can have an idea of the type of questions, how you could use this framework. Um, what I want to pop out here um, is with regards to uh, talking about a new diagnosis, having places to signpost to, it's true of ST1, but also more importantly as you get older, so applying for ST3, ST4, knowing where you could signpost parents to. So in this instance, Down Syndrome Association website, or if you were talking about seizures using epilepsy action or asthma, Asthma UK, it's really important to have um, where parents can get more information as a way of concluding your, um, your communication session. So the next thing I said is about, um, you often are asked, uh, questions about treatment and management. So for example, step up of asthma management. Now again, I'm not going to go through each of these because it, I, you can go back and look at how to use the framework. But the important thing here is what do the parents want to know? So if this was an example of escalating, stepping up asthma management because a child had been admitted several times and has interview symptoms, do you ask the parents what their concerns are about starting the treatment, so starting that preventer medication, because that is going to help you to structure your subsequent discussion. So if they tell you they're worried about the side effects of steroids and worried about growth suppression, you know, you then know that that's what you need to talk about instead of just giving a blanket approach about talking about all the different treatments there are and why you chose a preventer. Um, However, it's, it's still important to talk about when you're discussing the issue, alternative treatments and the risk benefits. So your thought processes behind choosing that treatment. Um, when it comes to breaking bad news, again, you'd still use this structure. The main thing is you want to be empathetic. Um, you wanna be open and honest. So that does involve saying, you know, your child is incredibly ill and needs a higher level of care or it's just important not to skirt around the issue. If perhaps for more senior levels, so ST4, you're having to disclose a potential cancer diagnosis, you know, you want to be open and honest, use the word cancer, don't skirt around the issue. With these scenarios, um, parents might say to you, you know, is my child gonna die? And I think I just wanted to include this phrase here, in response to that, you can say, you know, your child is very sick, but we are doing everything we can. So again, the, with these slides, I just wanted to point out kind of top tips for each of these scenarios, which are the general scenarios that um, you're going to be asked. Um, the other thing with bad news, always give them the opportunity to meet up with you because this is such a difficult time. They're going to have a lot of questions. So arrange a further meeting as part of your closure to this communication scenario. Um, I'm not sure if Bill did mention medical error, but again, it's something you can use the framework for. Um, the key points to remember if your communication scenario involves medical error is to think, 
does the patient or parent know about the error um, or do they not know? Because that's going to affect what you need to say. The next thing you need to think about is, has there been harm caused or is there no harm? Because again, that affects what you're going to say. If there was some kind of harm caused from giving a wrong drug dosage, you need to then think about the effect. So the side effects, communicate those side effects to the patient or parent, and then think about investigation. So what do you need to do to see if there are side effects? So in the instance of giving too high a dose of gentamicin, um, you're going to need to do gentamicin levels, renal function testing, audiology follow-up. But if there's no harm done, that doesn't mean you're off the case, you don't have to talk more about it. You've got to still acknowledge the concerns, reassure the parent that it's not been done. But the, the main point which I've put in bold about any of these medical error communication scenarios is to apologize. Um, it's about saying that you're going to report the clinical incident so that it can be looked at by management, see what went wrong and how we can stop it happening in future. And it's all about duty of candor. So I'm not sure if that's something you, you guys have come across, but it's a really important phrase about how medical professionals need to be open and honest when harm or potential harm has occurred. Um, so those are the main points about medical errors. With conflict resolution, again, you use the structure, but the main things to take away from it are you want to aim to diffuse the anger, um, give you know, them time to rant. So it's uncomfortable, you know, but don't be afraid of the silence. Let them talk, come to a natural end. Make sure that you acknowledge why they're angry and apologize. So without taking the blame in this instance. Um, so you're sorry they feel that way, which is always the annoying thing that you hear, but it is what you need to say. But with conflict resolution, without going through a scenario, I just wanted to include um, perhaps the most useful phrase that I learned um, in training from, from communication courses was, if the situation is escalating, if someone is getting angry to you, then you say, you can see from their reaction how much they care about their child. Um, and you say that you want to reassure them that their child is your priority also. And I find that's a really nice phrase of de-escalating the situation, particularly in communication scenarios. If the role player is being unfair to you um, and is deliberately starting to rant and rave, saying that you can see how much their child means to them, that you feel the same, helps to diffuse the situation. Um, again, I'm just going to skip through these slides. It's just an example of a conflict resolution scenario that you could be given, how you would use the framework and what possible phrases you could say, um, but just something for you to go back on. The main point which is shown in bold is that with these conflict resolution scenarios, you want to reassure the parent that action will be taken. And so in this instance, it's about submitting your incident report form, your IR form. But the other thing, and I'm not sure if this is a universal um, or international idea, is by signposting them to PALS. So that's the important point to mention in a conflict resolution angry parent scenario, that sending them to PALS, which is this hospital-based organization of non-medical professionals, um, and they are there to give advice, help the parent manage a complaint. So you want to make sure that in your scenario, you are... Um, directing them to PALS. So those are all of the patient parent carer scenarios. Um, and in the last few minutes, do I still have five minutes? Yes, yes, we still you have Fab. 20 minutes. Fab. So <laughs> in the last of um, the presentation, I just want to talk about communication scenarios that you'd come across, which involve colleagues. Um, so teaching, so even I remember my initial ST1 application, I was given a teaching scenario about fever in under fives. Um, and similarly, as you go higher up ST3, four consultant, you'll be given scenarios about teaching colleagues. And then there's also the supervision issues, um, which I think Bill has already dealt with there. Um, in terms of teaching, so similarly, it's a good idea to think about the possible topics that could come up. Um, and then whether it's by yourself or with uh, colleagues. So practice those scenarios using the same basic framework. Um, 
as I said, it's really hard. Ideally, I'd like to go through and do an interactive, you know, scenario and talk about, um, you know, what went well, what went badly, um, and what could be improved rather. But I think it's hard to do in this format in a virtual online with so many participants. So I just want to include the top tips about when you're given these teaching communication scenarios. Remember to read the case carefully. So clarify who it is you are teaching. So um, recently we have an exit exam called the START exam, which is an informal assessment, but one of the stations is about teaching. So you get a couple of minutes to prepare and I prepared my teaching for medical students about um, pediatric history taking. But actually when I then met the panel, it was a panel of ST2s and ST3s. So I'd pitched it at completely an inappropriate level, which would be far too basic for people who've already been practicing as pediatricians for two, three years. So the most important point about teaching, clarify who you're teaching to, so you tailor the level of teaching. The other thing is you have limited time. So you get a few minutes, you cannot cover the topic in anywhere near as much detail as you would want to. It will feel uncomfortable, but you just have to pick three points. So three basic points to talk about, um, which might even be a couple of lines each. Um, you know, say if you were talking about history taking, so how to do a pediatric history taking, you could say, I'm going to focus on the three points that are different um, when it comes to taking a history from children to taking a history from adults. So those three points are within the past medical history, you've got to ask about the antenatal perinatal history. Um, and the second point I'm gonna talk about is the differences in the social history. Um, so with regards to growth and development. Um, and then the third point within the social history is about the difference with regards to um, the social setup of the child, so whether they are known to a social worker. So it does feel uncomfortable because it feels like this really inadequate teaching session, but you do not have the time. So um, just pick three main points. Um, and again, this slide is just going through how you use that framework, um, the type of things that you can say. Um, I'm not gonna go through it because it's just a case of reading off the slide, using it as a base to practice um, what you can say in your teaching scenarios. Um, so the reason, just picking out another main point, as well as thinking about who you're teaching, you know, thinking about just keeping it simple, always close again by signposting. And I've just included some of the useful websites you could signpost um, medical students or junior colleagues to. So don't forget the bubbles is fab. And I don't know if any of you have come across it, but generally when you're researching or looking into a topic, don't forget the bubbles is a pediatric run website, um, which gives really concise um, but clear information about topics. You've got Healthier Together, which is information for both parents and professionals. Then thinking about what guidelines you could signpost to so that people could read further, whether they're you know, Royal College based, whether they're um, NICE guidelines or BTS British Thoracic guidelines if you're teaching about asthma. So think who it is you're teaching, what their level is, stick to time, signpost. Now, in terms of supervision, I think this is something you've covered with Bill and you can go back to these slides, um, but use the framework. So if we go through talking about a trainee who's always late, you know, we've already spoken about it in the SPIES acronym um, about seeking information, has patient care been compromised, using your initiative. So the action that you're gonna take um, escalating and how are you gonna support the trainee? These are just useful phrases that you can use for your communication scenarios. So, you know, in terms of um, introducing the case, you, you want to say, before we go further, I wanted to ask if everything is okay outside of work, um, because ultimately you want to be supportive, you want to be neutral um, and non-accusatory. So you don't, the idea isn't to, you know, berate the trainee for always being late, it's to find out why they're late um, and what you can do together uh, to try and explore and overcome the issue. So again, 
I'm not going to go through the, the blue phrases of what you can say, but the overall point when you get your supervision, your trainee and difficulty scenarios is to be neutral. So you don't want to accuse them. You want to see if it's actually a problem, why it's a problem. And then most importantly, with these scenarios um, is close it by saying, you know, let's arrange another time to meet in a couple of weeks time to see how things are going. So I think that's what they want to hear. That's where you'll score the points. So in summary, um, once again, I apologize, it's been such a didactic speak at you, but um, we've just gone through, in terms of your written application, some of the top tips and those three acronyms that can, you can use to structure your answer, to get your points across, to make it relevant um, and sell yourself within the word limit. Most important thing about the written application is get it checked um, so that you don't read what you want to be reading. Um, get someone else, medical, non-medical, to read through it to make sure it makes sense and that you're getting your main points across. With regards to the interview communication, um, the general points, just think about what it is you're being asked for. And then in terms of how you're going to talk, use that basic framework and you can tailor it to any type of communication scenario and it helps to get you through the fear of a, a scary a scary um situation unless you're fine with interviews but um for me it was always something that i worried about but there really is no need to worry if you've got your basic framework to fall back on um, and hopefully I've just gone through some of the scenarios, which basically they are the main scenarios. There, there might be more, but I think those are the main ones that you're asked when it comes to interacting with patients and pa parents or with colleagues. Um, so I just wanted to include all those slides that I have gone through with the blue writing, which is, gives you useful phrases that you can talk about. But when it comes to interview communication, the most important thing is to practice, whether it's practicing alone in front of the computer camera or mirror, or whether it's in a group. So I've just, I've included some of the references here. Um, whilst I know that there are people applying for pediatric training from ST1, um, we do have an MRCPCH, so a membership website for your membership exams. They actually have communication scenarios, but they also have communication videos, um, which are really useful actually to run through examples. Um, they've got videos of ones that are uh, not so good and ones which show better examples of how best to communicate. So I, I do recommend using these websites. Um, this document, which is I included an excerpt from um, in one of the slides, is about how um, senior pediatricians can write communication scenarios. So it's a good idea to look at it from the other side because then you get an appreciation of what they want you to say. Um, and then, you know, the ST1 and ST34 guidance, so person specification, it's basically the same. And again, it's useful to read just to give you pointers about where the marks for communication lie. So the other thing I wanted to say, apart from thank you for having me today and all the best with whatever you're applying for, um, the other thing which I was thinking, do I include it, do I not? Um, I'm certainly not advertising or working for these companies, but if you feel that you are worried about the application process, um, this is the book that um, we tend to use. So it's the ISC... Um, medical interviews book and it does talk about specific um, pediatric applications. The reason why I was reluctant to mention this is because you do not need this for your applications. Um, you know you're a practicing doctor you would have had the right experience but just if it's something you're really worried about there is this book. I think it's it's around £25. Um, there are also should you have any unexpected windfall gains or do a locum bank shift and have additional money and if the interviews are something you're worried about the isc this company also do medical interview courses um i am reluctant to say it because firstly i'm not 
working for them. Secondly, the interview courses are a few hundred pounds. So it is a huge amount of money for something you don't need, but it is only if you're in this very privileged situation where you've got the money to spare. I did this ISC medical course before my consultant interview, um, and it was a life saviour, but it's not as important um, for interviews for training. Um, and it is not needed. I think just stick to the top tips and the basic framework, remembering to get your answers checked and to practice. And that, um, that is that. Um, is there any questions, anyone? Silence. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Uh, I think no point. more, no more question um, on the chat box. And I would like to announce that um, thank you for uh, signposting people to that um, interview courses and all that. They are lucky because we have our mock interview workshop ah. next week. We are arranging mock interview for those who ah. will be accepted for the ST1 interview. Um, after the shortlisting um, release result. And it will be another one, another workshop mock, um, workshop for those who will um, be accepted for ST3, ST4 level. Thank Lovely. you. I, I want to say, Newhart, that will be more than enough. I am only including this. If, like me, you're afraid of interviews mm -hmm. and yeah. you leave everything to the last minute, because they run them so often, it helps. But it's it's a just in case. I think these courses, yeah. workshops, practicing are more than enough. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, that's right. I think Elam or Dr. Babiki has his hand up. Hello. Yes, it's me. I'm asking about um, the SQ1. There is um, there is uh, in the timetable that there is uh, uh, upgrading. You can upgrade or hold the post. Uh, I, I don't know, to ST3 or 4 or what. And there is two weeks gap difference between ST1 and ST3, 4. Fine. Is that a general question or is it something from one of the screenshots I included? Um, no. Um, if you applied for ST1 and they give you that uh, you have uh, interview and uh, you, you have the post and you applied at the well for ST3 and 4 and you have been <coughs> shortlisted, I'm asking about the upgrade. There is uh, some line you can upgrade from ST1. So uh, there is two weeks difference. How can you manage this? I couldn't get it. Fine. I, I just I, I understand what you said. I just wanted to ask again, did you read that from one of my slides or is it some information that you've got from elsewhere? Uh, no, not from your slides, doctor. Fine, fine. Good, because um, I didn't want to give any information about the actual process and I wish I could answer that for you, but I don't know enough about the current process now to give um, a proper answer to that. But I'm sure on the Royal College website, the, if you search by Google and type RCPCH contact number or on the website, email them, then please do email the RCPCH committee and I'm sure they would be able to answer that. I just I don't want to answer anything wrong here, but certainly the Royal College website will have email or contact details unless any of the um, organisers can answer that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, is, is the college website? Well, I'm guessing it is something that you use. I can find an email for them now and put it in the chat if, if you'd like. Hello, I have put a question in the chat that I think uh, wasn't seen. So it's, it's about the teaching topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if I don't have, I know that usually when we're preparing for a teaching topic, I will have time at home to do the, to prepare for it. So if I, I was given a topic that I don't have the full knowledge or I, I can't remember everything. So is it okay if I, I've just made it like an interactive session and try to speak in general terms or, or I will be 
like um, um, required to have like more, uh, a, a bit of details in the topic. No, That's absolutely, absolutely. I think be confident about it, but it's about having a structure in that scenario when you're faced with something you know absolutely nothing about. You still start by asking what the grade is, um, asking what they want to know, and then you say, right, the first bit, we're going to be interactive, learn from each other, and you can, you know, deflect it and ask, you know, what they already know, and it will be a panel, so hopefully someone will know something. And then the other side of it is, then you can always say where to go for more information. Um, so yeah, it's about being, making it interactive and flipping it so that actually they're telling you what they know already. Um, it's about, you can then, the second part would be using a structure to say, you say, these are the important things to know about it. Because if it's a condition, you can say, you know, you want to know about incidents, presentation, management, complications. And then the third part would be about saying where to go for more information. So you're still giving the teaching session. It's not about an actual, you know, the ins and outs and the knowledge you may or may not have, but you're still giving the teaching session. So flipping it so that they interact, saying what you need to know. And even if you yourself don't know, you say where you would get the information from. So you could say, look at local guidelines on management of you. UTI in under three months. Look at the nice guidelines for under for management under three months. Um, also look at you know patient information leaflets so that you know how you're going to communicate the information to parents. So do not panic if you don't know the topic. Just flip it. Say what they need to know in terms of the general structure and then where they can find the information from, and that will still count as um, how you teach. Okay, thank you very much. That's very useful. Thank you. We still have four minutes. Any questions? Take a break, have a tea. No questions from our participants? Um, I'm just going to put... Um, oops. I just sent it to you. I don't know um, if that's helpful at all, but if you follow the link and it's got the different people that you can ask, or there's a phone number, which actually the Royal College are always good at answering the phone during the week. So um, please do ask them about the upgrading. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Katie, for this comprehensive, uh, useful um, presentation. Uh, no thank, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. All the best for the participants. So uh, we are going for 30 minutes breaks. My name is Salma Mohammed. I'm going to be the moderator for the next couple of sessions. Um, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker. Um, who is Dr. Salil Pradhan, who is one of the ST6 trainees. Um, he's currently working as a pediatric registrar at Calderdale Royal Hospital. Um, and he will be presenting the next session on reflective practice. Um, Dr. Pradhan, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you, Salma. Just trying to share my video with this one. Okay, uh, thank you Salma for the good introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the British Citizens Association of Pediatrics and Child Health uh, for this opportunity to give some contribution to your uh, setup. A very nice initiative. Okay. So as uh, Salma said, I am Salim. 
I'm Salil Pradhan. I work as a pediatric registrar in Halifax. It's a district general hospital. Uh, it's called a Delroy Hospital. Is the full name. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly, but not so briefly, maybe, about uh, reflective practices that we normally do, uh, the way it differs uh, in the United Kingdom, and how it is going to help all of us to learn to change practices um, and to become better physicians, doctors in general. Okay. So at any point in time, if you have any questions, yes, I'm free to answer those. If I, if I know the answers, obviously. Uh, and you can always ask in chats or raise your hands or unmute yourself. More than welcome to listen to everything. Okay. So I'll be rolling the slides then. Any technical problems, you can uh, consult the moderators. Okay, thank you. So as I said, reflective practice, uh, this is done by all of us, whether we're in this country, uh, I mean the United Kingdom or any, any, any other part of the world. As doctors, uh, as human beings, uh, we are we do reflect on things we do recall things and think good or bad things about it similarly in the professional setup as well when things unfold when we do things basically we think about it uh, reflection in the wider sense would be you know thinking about in a different way possibly not about just about recollections but thinking about it in a way how to improvise yourself in a way, how to help other people, in a way, how to be more useful to the setup. Okay, it's about self-improvement, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So objectives of today's session is in some way to delve and know why does one reflect, particularly in the medical profession. Obviously, we will, we may be come able to come to a conclusion that uh, why learning, how it helps in learning and uh, learn about the importance of reflection as well. Uh, the ways in which uh, reflection shapes our being, our improvement is the other step. And uh, how to reflect in general, is there any rule to it? Uh, is there anything that, that we need to avoid? Or is there a set rule, you know, meaning like, is there a set way to do it? That's how we're going to do it. Okay. I'm sure in the audiences, we have a wide range of people here. Some of, more, many of you have, are probably already working in the United Kingdom. Some of you may be just in the process of entering the country. So a few things here may be redundant to you. Like basically, I already know these things. That's fine. If you know, it's even better. Uh, it will be to reinforce your learning. And some of the things may be, you know, quite new. And so if you can grasp uh, what is being discussed, then it, uh, I would think that uh, whatever talk I'm giving would be a success. <laughs> so if you, this definition of reflective practice, there's not a set definition. Uh, you can all form your own definitions about it. There's not a set rule to define it, but this is not my, these are not my words. I have done some searches and whatever things uh, have come to my mind or whatever has impressed me, I've taken those things. Okay, the, the references will be at the very end. I will provide them. So definition of reflective practice, as we go through the process whereby an individual thinks analytically, basis, basically analyzes about anything related to their professional practice. So it can be good things, bad things, you know, average things, whatever it can be. With the intention of gaining insight, meaning that with the intention of gaining some knowledge uh, with the thoughts and using the lessons in the end to maintain good practice or make improvements, that's the most important thing. Just about just reflecting and thinking about things would not be enough. If it's not making you better, then uh, it, it may possibly be just like writing a story or you know a work of fiction or something. But if that process where you're reflecting 
is helping you in professional, maintaining professional standards, rather improvising it, then that would be what our aim would be for. Okay. And so, so reflections can help us in many different ways. Uh, uh, can help us to identify how best we learn, making use of more, uh, making us more effective learners. That's what I've been telling. Uh, so develop critical thinking, an important skill in medical practice, which is uh, critical thinking is very, very important. We can be critics of ourselves rather than becoming critics, criticizing about other people. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, all about self-improvement. If we can criticize ourselves in a just and good way, possibly that paves way for us becoming good human beings and good professionals as well. The emphasis should be on improving our clinical practice. And also, once we start reflecting, it has to be demonstrated or there should be some tangible proof that we are doing so because at the end of each year, it's very important that whoever is supervising you or the panel who reviews your progression in the UK, ARCP happen every day. This annual review of competency of progression each year after you enter training, there will be ARCTs where a panel sits and finds out about your progress, what you've done good, what, is, what can be improved. And one of the things that they will be looking amongst many other things, one of the things they will be looking forward or looking to is how you're evolving as a doctor, what your thought processes are, and how good a thinker you are, how good a learner you are, basically. Even though when we start, we may not be as proficient, we may not know many things, but if we have the stance of learning and taking it forward from there, that is the attitude many of the senior colleagues look, look towards on us. And our reflections should appropriately reflect that we are actually doing it actively. We're thinking about our practice, we're thinking about ourselves in a critical way and to find that uh, we are doing everything to improve the practice, clinical practices in our hospitals, in our work setup, uh, as well as fostering ourselves as safe clinicians. So that's, uh, that was all about demonstration and we need uh, demonstration also means that we need to record it somewhere. And I would be talking where exactly to record it uh, in my further slides. So, so steps, you know, case and e-portfolio is the Royal College uh, portfolio to record all our learnings in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, uh, all the doctors in training, it is mandatory to have case and e-portfolio. Those who are in non-training grades can also subscribe to it and get access to it. This is very important. Once you have access to it, you can uh, record all your supervised learning events, your procedural skills, um, the meetings that you have attended, the teaching that you have attended, the teaching that you've delivered, and amongst many other th things, obviously, the things that you've reflected uh, on, on way of becoming a good doctor also is recorded in Kazen. Uh, so it comes under the tab of developmental log, reflections. Uh, unlike other things, it is not an assessment. So if you want to reflect on a certain thing in a good way or a bad way, whatever it is, you can take the driver's seat and write about it and then save it. So you do not have to send it to somebody else to sign it off, like uh, if it were a case-based discussion or some other forms of exercise you would have to ask a senior to do it for you once you start. But in this case, it's your soul, like you would be writing it up and saving it up. But then at some point, it will be reviewed by your supervisor as well as the ARCP panel uh, in an appropriate way, okay? Uh, is there any questions so far or anything that's not clear? Uh, more than happy to. There aren't any questions on the chat box. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Solomon. 
So what can reflections be about? It can be about many different things. Uh, so, you know, a situation observed, you don't have to be a part of a situation to reflect on it. As people we will be seeing many different things in our lives, in professional lives, obviously, uh, we would not be a part of all the things or events that are happening. Some other colleagues may, may, may have maybe taking a driver's seat on that. They may be involved in it. Like, you know, if somebody is doing something exceedingly well, like uh, talking to parents, explaining the diagnosis, uh, taking care of our, about their colleagues or something, we, we as human beings will, will see it. Uh, maybe we do not, are not vocal about it. But any good or bad behaviors will be will come be processed in our brains. But that's what I'm seeing. A situation, any kind of situation being observed, good, bad, moderate, whatever it is, you can reflect about it. But you know, reflections should not be happening in each and everything. Like you know, it it has to be something significant. I would say uh, because you would not be writing reflections every day. You would not have time to do that. If you're given a six-month job, then two or three reflections is what I tend to do, but that's not a set standard. You can do more if you want to, you know, if, if you come across more interesting situations where learning can be derived from it, why not? Or maybe if you've not had much opportunities, maybe one or two, at least you have to touch on the topic. Two or three uh, is what I've been doing for the last six years, every six months. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it can be a situation where you're directly involved. So our direct involvement is basically with uh, the patients, uh, their parents, be us being pediatric doctors, parents or their carers, or you know the colleagues uh, where we, whom we are working with. So there are uh, there are integral part of our system. So there can be some very good you know, feelings about colleagues, or sometimes we do not. We're not on the same page, and uh, how do we handle such such situations? Uh, it should not be a part of blaming process about anybody. It should rather foster our focus on how we learn from each other. Okay, or if if you've been on a training program, or if you are attending university or some other form of class, uh, classroom lectures where you've been very impressed by the learnings that they have uh, tried to give to you. Then you can reflect on it. You know anything as, as I said, or part of formal learning that has been you know, very effective for you. You know any kind of like just imagine any topic. Uh, you know, say growth and development, and you have uh, had a very wonderful lecture of uh, how can, uh, children develop. Then yeah, well, why not reflect on it or some other topics, maybe genetics or whatever comes to your mind. If something has touched you, then as a uh, in your log developmental log reflection and give the topic and then write about it okay i will be giving you some points what exactly how exactly to write and what not to write but you know i'm not a teacher here you are you can do your own ways maybe much better than i suggest so you know as part of uh, clinicians you would be developing each year so and, and exceedingly you'll be doing better and better So anything can be good or bad. Uh, if we reflect on ourselves, uh, we do have uh, many good qualities, virtuous qualities, and uh, as human beings, all of us have vices as well, like bad qualities. We all know, maybe it's not necessary that we talk about it all the time, but if reflections will let us identify some positive behaviors, and if we do that, so positive behaviors, good thing, we just need to reinforce it. Say, if you're handling a research situation very well, patient has come in, come with cardiopulmonary arrest, and you've been into a situation, been the taken leadership role, allocated jobs, you know, make sure that things are running smoothly as per the APLS or NLS guidelines. Uh, things are getting done, monitored, somebody's writing the script uh, about timelines, the drugs are being given on time, all the necessary teams are there, uh, kind of you inform the consultants and, you know, consultants would be there, obviously. So everybody is feeling, look, feeling looked after after the after the whole research situation finishes or uh, is done. Then if you're looking after your colleagues, talking about, talking to them, 
how do they feel if particularly if there are any junior colleagues and you want to you want to go and uh, ask them how they feel they may not have seen such things in the past you know so mainly all positive things if you think that okay i handle those things so well i need to proactively foster that i need to proactively push it forward is the one thing that you could do or on the flip side of the coin if there are negative thoughts that are coming okay i've been on a research situation but you know i did not allocate roles properly properly to people if that comes to your mind then this can be uh, a, an exercise where you can improve yourself the next time you're in a research situation you be there see see look at people and say okay you do airways by name obviously we do all always call them by the name if we know them otherwise we do have a brief introduction uh, you do this you do this kind of all the jobs and jobs are split so next time you're going to do it and the, the fact that you reflected on on your shortcomings earlier actually is going to help you the next time you do it so that's all about reflection actually uh, getting uh, developing yourself and helping the system so you know if there are negatives yes we will make it as a positive change and that's all about it if there are positives keep at it or maybe improvise on it and that's going to help the whole system as a whole so if you have to reflect then it's not all about storytelling so just imagine a situation where uh, you've met a very difficult parent who is not happy about the care that they've been receiving, their child has been receiving in the hospital. If I were to reflect on it, and if I said, uh, Mr. A approached me and uh, kind of whatever things he said, it's not about storytelling. He complained about these, 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 these things, kind of A, B, C to J, J whatever is, is the problem. It's not only about a de description of a story, and uh, also it's not about being critical about anybody. If you're not happy about a system, and it's not about blaming somebody that, okay, I'm reflecting on it, that cannula was not done on time, the antibiotics were not given on time. So that person is responsible, or this nurse, or that doctor is responsible. No, though that's an absolute no in terms of reflection. Events, you can describe it, these things happened well, these things did not happen. However, at no point in time, you should be dwelling and delving into things that uh, such an individual did this wrong. No, that's, that's absolutely not taken in. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously it, it, it has to inculcate increased understanding about our daily practices, uh, which leads to change of practice, may lead to change of practice. Not every reflection will lead to change in practice, but some of them, many of them will, in, in one way or the other, in your internal mindset, it, it, it has the capacity to do that. so it must be emphasized that when you're entering anything on your portfolio most important thing you're not putting anybody's name anybody's date of birth no hospital numbers okay it, a child an eight-year-old child is fine okay but not with like an eight-year-old child with more descriptions where it can lead towards uh, revealing the identity of the patient that's not a, not a given thing that's not accepted everything has to be fully anonymized okay uh, mr a mr b is fine and we do as practitioners in the united kingdom and elsewhere in the world obviously uh, we should not be spilling any secrets about any patients also confidentiality is confidentiality is of utmost importance uh, and for information governance, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, there are very stringent and strict rules about not talking about patients when it's not necessary outside of the work and then this and that happened, such and such parent was like that. So it's a good practice not to be judgmental about it. And the same reflects on your reflections as well. If you're not naming somebody, if you're not giving enough hint, who could it be? That's always better. 
Okay. Um, so your reflections will only be read by your supervisor, ideally, and the ARCP panel if necessary. Uh, so it's not for all of your friends to look at and find, okay, what, how good a writer you are, how good a storyteller you are. That's not, a, not, that's not a point, you know, it has to, you may take some guidances from senior people on how to write it. But then once you write it, it's your property, it has to be confidential, and it is for the audience meant only for your supervisors and for the ARCP panel. Yeah, if they decide to use it in any other way, then that's a different thing. But yes, um, confidentiality in all walks of life, particularly in the practices in the United Kingdom, whenever you join this country, or if you're already in the country, you would know it quite well. Uh, talking about patients necessarily, or when, when there's no need to, outside of this hospital setup in particular, is, is, um, is not acceptable. Uh, if you're giving precise locations, dates and times, then that may give some information as well. Particularly if I tell that uh, precise location is called the Del Royal Hospital a &E recess, date uh, September 29th uh, and time 4 p.m. So that's easily, you know, if you go on to the online system, it can be brought um, um, what happened at the time can al already be seen. Then people may come to know about what exactly happened. Okay, so let's not do that either. So once you have identified what to reflect on, then you have to document it quite well. Uh, so documented evidence of reflection all goes in casing for now. As I said, development of log, reflection, then you start your reflections. So it should demonstrate a professional attitude to maintaining good medical practice. Whenever you start a job in the United Kingdom, General Medical Council is the one who oversees us, guides us. There are rules and regulations that all of us are bound to. And your conduct, whatever you're doing, not doing, should actually reflect on the parameters of the good medical practice guidelines defined by the General Medical Council. So if you go into the General Medical Council website and search for good, uh, good medical practice behaviors, there will be ample information available and actually that your reflective practice should also incorporate all of those teachings yeah so reflection as i said not reflecting is not about merely about storytelling it's more about what lessons you've learned from the story okay if you go and watch a film Maybe you get entertained, but not all the time we, we think about, oh, what did I learn from watching this film? No, no. A general person, a normal person is just go there for entertainment. So there will be no difference in between watching a film and writing a reflection if you do not learn things. You do not have to learn things from watching a film or, writing, or reading a novel. But yes, we do have to learn things by reflecting on something. So reflections, as I said, can be about a good thing or a bad thing or something something that has affected you or something that has inspired you, something that you think, oh, this is a very new thing, this is going to help me, then you can reflect on that. So that should show the ability to learn from and develop one's own in system-wide practice. If you have been able to change your practice, that's great. If you've been able to inspire others, into changing their practices or maybe some other guidelines have been formed in your department or hospital following your reflection, you've initiated some changes, then that is even greater. That is going to show how you're evolving as a leader. So not about just about reflection, your leadership skills as well as you grow in years from ST1 to ST2 to all the way to ST8 and consultants. The most, the one thing that must grow in all of us is how we develop as leaders. You know, leadership skills as, an, as a very junior doctor may not be that good, or maybe they have, there are scopes of improvement. But when you become a senior, say a consultant or maybe an ST8, you would not be doing all the small jobs like bleeding a person, so a heel prick, and uh, collecting urine samples, doing urine dips, and you know, doing ECGs, not that. But you need to be aware those things have, have to be done. You have to delegate people. You have to make sure that you're a leader. 
whom people listen to. So basically, you know, de developing leadership also has to be a part and reflection in some ways will be, will have to be focused in how you are developing as a leader from year, year by year, there should be some improvement. It does not happen overnight. It does not happen over a period of six months. It happens, it takes time. And you would know when things start changing in your own mindset, it will give you confidence. At some point in time, it will give you confidence. And uh, that's how we're looking for, just looking at the time, that's fine, okay? So any learning opportunities while reflecting, that's, that's even better, okay? as well as, um, as I said, demonstrates the ability to be a responsible, self-directed learner. So, so there are certain things other people will teach you, but there comes a point where if you're not grasping things, they can't hold your hand and direct you all the way through your training. Okay, many things will have to be self-directed. You have to sit down yourself dwell within yourself what is right with me what is not right with me if something's right with me i should take take this forward if there's something not right with me how do i tackle it where do i seek help i'm sure you know this is my the, the focus of my talk, talk is not to go in that direction so basically reflecting on things and this is this thing is not going too well so i need to seek help from somewhere and then you start widening your horizons and looking for it. So, you know, learning yourself, seeking help appropriately, and helping others in need when you find that, yeah, they are struggling as well, uh, in, a, in a very you know, non-judgmental way. Okay, so that's, that's how reflections can help us with. And as we've been, I've, I've been re-emphasizing the same things again, possibly reinforcing the same things. Some things have repeated, but that's how we do to reinforce our learnings. Learning can be from positive and successful situations. Uh, I'd like to do not focus on only negative things while reflecting. As human beings, we are successful in many regards. Sometimes outside of the work, we may be successful well, in sports, uh, we may be good singers, uh, we may play the guitar very well, we may be very good writers, or we may just be excellent at something. Or similarly, at work as well, as a whole, we should not think that, oh, I'm there, I can't do this thing, I can't do that thing. I think I'm failing. No, this is not good. Amongst many things that you've been doing, there are other people who would be watching you. They would be seeing your behavior and saying, okay, uh, this person is doing this well. At least uh, he's, he empathizes well. He understands. He he's a calm person. You know, he helps others when when they are in need. He does not rush things up, which you you may not be aware, but you know others would be aware. So, positive and successful situations means like if a person has come to you, like a parent has come to you in great distress, and you've been able to calm them down by explaining everything bit by bit in, in greater detail, step by step. You know, they would be crying, obviously, my child is unwell, uh, what do I do? I don't know what's happening. You would have gone through those situations a number of times, maybe dozens of times, but for them, that would be the first time it would have been happening. So that is your opportunity to shine and help. You would go there and explain things as calmly as possible. Obviously, doing that means like they may not be listening at the first instant, but you will try your manners, your professional attitudes and everything to make them understand this is a situation. And in, at the end of the day, it's about explaining what you're already doing to make it right. You know, the outcome so we may, yeah? We've got five minutes left. Okay, I'm, I'm not too far then, yeah, okay. So, delving about positive and successful situations, yeah? Or something where things have not gone right, as from the incidents that uh, like, there's been a cardiac arrest or there's been a big complaint about things. So we can also monitor and uh, we can learn from them. So learning can be from the positive thumbs up or from other negative impacts as well, okay? So better, if the reflection is measured, 
uh, meaning that uh, do not have to write a whole novel about it. And when you are raw in your feelings, when you're hurt or when you're very happy, don't basically, I would say, not do it. Let your emotions calm down before spilling your thoughts. Because once it goes into the system, it goes into the system. Maybe even if you delete it, possibly some people, higher ups can still see it. So do not rush about things in doing reflections. So be meticulous about it, measured way, and uh, do not do it when you're in a rush or something has just happened and you're in an adrenaline rush, you say, and come, okay, I'm going to write a reflection about it. You know, I'm going to make it effective. No, it possibly does not work it that way for many of us, okay? So brief description of what you're reflecting on. Uh, be succinct about it. Outline the circumstances in general terms. As I said, anonymity is very important, not giving in many information about the patients. And uh, as I've emphasized many times now, ensure that you an 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 anonymize the data, or names and everything, date of births, and absolutely no. So when you delve into it, feelings, what are your reactions of feelings to the event in general? Positive, negative, feel good about it, feel bad about it. It's up to you to make, a, make, make for that. Don't be judgmental to yourself and others, particularly when your reactions and feelings are still raw. There's no point uh, being judgmental about yourself or to you, about your colleagues that like you can always, maybe you, those things may be processed in your mind, but it should not come in written form. And as I said, if, if you're feeling raw about something, then take your time. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as I said, arrange, uh, if, you, if, if you need help about reflecting on a particular thing, then it's always good to, to ask for help from seniors. Evaluation, uh, what was the outcome? Yeah, you would know about after reflecting about a certain thing. What, could, what was good and could have been done differently about the event. So this is a learning exercise. Once you reflect uh, any, about anything, what could have been done better is the most important thing I would say, or what could have been avoided uh, so that we could have not been in that situation at all. Okay. So, so last part is analysis. What have you learned is the most important thing from the whole thing. What steps will you now take on the basis of what you've learned? Okay, this, these are the two most important things. These are the things that we should be emphasizing on. Um, the story does not play the lead. It's actually the learning and unlearning that is the most important thing. So if there's any takeaway from what I've learned, talked about in the last half an hour or so, what you have learned and what steps will you take now to, to do good about good, something good or you know, how would you rectify your errors and mistakes is important. And uh, so learning outcomes is, is explained there. I think I'm with just almost at the end of my talk. References, I took several of these and some other forms as well. So I thank you for listening so patiently and best wishes for all your tra training applications. Uh, and uh, finally, if there's anything that you would like to ask later that it's not possible in this short span of time, then that's my email address. You can use it. Uh, for... We actually have got 10 minutes for questions. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the yeah. end of my presentation. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I would... There are a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, one of them um, is asking, how will they be asked about reflection during the interview? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I, I think what they're trying to understand is um, in what in what way they'll be asked to are they actually going to be asked to reflect on a particular event and in during the interview. So I did my SD one interview a long time ago. In that at that point in time, I do not remember somebody asking me about particularly about reflections. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, things may have changed since then. Maybe in when you're ST, applying for ST3-4, uh, they would possibly be asked in some way or the other. Um, they may frame a question about learning from an event. Uh, just to give an example about an event that has made, that you've learned from, maybe that kind of question may come, meaning that is actually reflection. Cite an example or an event 
that has made you change the clinical practice or cite an event, for example, that has made you think about you being a doctor, that those are vague questions, but something along that line may come. Reflection as a word may not be used directly, but mm. yeah, these kind of things basically insinuates that whether you're reflecting on your performances and whether actually you are working towards becoming a doctor good doctor a good human being by learning from those events okay um, i hope yeah. you, i have answered those things but i'm if i get more answers about it if i can be more specific if i know more then i'm i'm more than happy if you write to me i'll get back to you lovely thank you mm -hmm. i think there's just one more question which is very much similar to the previous one um mm -hmm. so they're wondering should they be preparing a positive or a negative reflection if they need to it, do yes so. it should it should be uh it does not matter whether it's positive or negative as long as there are learning outcomes not everything in life is positive not everything is negative so if you're following a structure that i've seen i've seen this event happening this is my analysis and these are the things that i've learned from it basically if as long as there are learning points and changes of practice that comes from it that, that you've learned these things, and this is how I'm going to change my practice to become on the road to becoming a doc better doctor or a better human being. That is what people would be looking towards rather than it being, you know, a death or, you know, your, your, your work that has saved a patient. Basically, you know, we can't avoid, none of us as a doctor can avoid positive or negative situations. This is not under our control. These things happen, unfold, but if we reflect, then we can possibly prevent things for happen, from happening in a bad manner in the future so that you would not be doing certain things that would actually uh, provide fodder to, to bad things or it can actually prevent things from happening. Okay. Uh, anybody else uh, would like to ask no, a question? These are all the questions. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. That was very helpful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I think we've got our next speaker, uh, Monica Nigoita. Hello. Hi. Uh, hello, Monica. Um, so Monica is um, our next speaker who will be talking to us about um, career motivation. Um, she is um, an enthusiastic senior pediatric trainee in community child health in West Yorkshire. She trained in Romania, um, Republic of Ireland and the UK and comes with a wide view and growing experience in medical education on different levels. She's um, completed a postgraduate diploma in child health at the University of Leeds and has been the chair of Yorkshire and Humber Regional Level 3 trainee-led pediatric trainee program and has driven the program's restructuring for online delivery during the pandemic. She also has helped deliver regional programs and on a national level she's part of the organizing committee for the neuro disability com community and she's one of uh, two national trainee representatives for the british association of community child health thank you so much salma sorry i get uh, um it's a very long introduction isn't it <laughs> it's an impressive um, one <laughs> So it's really nice to, um, and thank you for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, and I think, um, and this this station, the career motivation station, is something that um, most of us find hard to get our head around. I think. Um, and um, first, I should say that I'm happy to answer any questions as we go throughout the presentation. You can type in the chat. You can raise your hand. You can just unmute and and ask me. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to stop as you, as you have questions as I talk about specific things. Um, and it's really nice to see how many people are here today. So it's absolutely amazing to be part of this. Thank you. Um, to start with, I have a couple of questions for you um, who are part of this. So first, if you raise your hand at the bottom of your screen, you have, um, I think it's called re uh, reactions, if I remember correctly. Um, if you find raise your hand, so, and raise your hand if you have worked in pediatrics already, anywhere in the world, and then you can type in the chat, where in the world have you worked? 
So tell me, if you, raise your hand if you have worked in pediatrics and I shall be able to see, hopefully. I'm gonna ask you to do some work, sorry. So it should be at the bottom of your screen. I think it's called reactions. I think we've got lots of hands raised. Oh gosh, yeah, maybe I can't see it. Yes, there's loads of yes, loads of hands. Uh, excellent, so you've worked in pediatrics. Okay, tell me about, in the chat, tell me about India, Sudan, what's KSA, not sure. Um, oh, Saudi Arabia. Yes, okay, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Oman. This is amazing. Where else, go on. Uh, Sudan, Ireland, hi, I worked in Ireland. Ireland again. Uh, very nice. In the UK, somebody works in the UK, excellent. And loads, 20 years. Oh my goodness, Somia. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and then raise your hand again. So put your hand down and then raise your hand again if you worked in pediatrics in the UK. So both of those um, conditions. Yes, a few of you have. Excellent. Wonderful. It's really nice to see uh, who's here, I think, first of all. Um, one important thing that I want to say from the beginning is that you don't need to have worked in pediatrics to be a good candidate. And there are lots of transferable skills that you can bring to the table. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about them uh, in a bit um, in, in uh, the next slides. Um, and those who have not worked in the UK yet, welcome. We are so excited that you want to join us. I'm, I'm sure other colleagues who, have, who are working here already will um, uh, agree with that. Uh, let me move this so I can move my slides one sec. Okay. Um, so um, a little bit about my journey, I suppose, into pediatric training in the UK. I was born and raised in Romania. I went to a medical school there. I started working in pediatrics in Romania um, years ago, 2007, I think, um, and then worked in Republic of Ireland for a little bit and moved to the UK in 2013. I applied to the Yorkshire pediatric training pathway. It was separated at that point. I know now it's a more of a regional kind of national interview. Um, and I applied at ST2 level. Um, at that time, there were kind of specific rules about um, um, preventing people to apply at ST1 if you had more than 18 months. I think, I think it was experience in pediatrics. So like I had. So I joined training program a little bit later, um, sort of down the path. Uh, I joined the program in August 2014, and I joined the subspecialty training pathway for community pediatrics about three years ago. Um, and out of, uh, in the last kind of two months now, I'm a very new consultant in community pediatrics, uh, working in Leeds, and I reserve the right to keep the label new for at least two years. Um, and I have done my fair share of interviews. Um, and as I prepared for them, I went through this journey of understanding why do I want the job? And when the reasons are clear to you, why do you want to be a pediatrician? Then you can make them clear to anyone else and you can add your passion, your enthusiasm um, to your answers because you know that is what you want. And even if it takes you a few goes, even if you have to take a different route into pediatric training via non-training post like, like I did, um, and then apply again next year, you will still do it because this is who you wanna be. Um, and I suppose my main advice is also don't put unnecessary extra pressure on yourself for this interview. Um, prepare as best as you can, do your research, structure your, your answers, have it clear in your mind why you're good and why you would be a, a good person to do pediatrics. But don't add other, other, other pressures like, um, this will determine my career, it will determine my life and so on. It won't. You have, you have other options and you have other goals at this, even if it doesn't work from the first go. And extra pressure doesn't really help because you're in your fight or flight mode and you won't engage enough cortex when you answer the questions, okay? Um, and then granted, for some of you, you know, this interview may impact the visas, other practical stuff, but there are always other ways. 
and and just tell yourself this and i'm i'm completely honest when i'm saying it us the training program the nhs um we need you more than what you how much you need us and and workforce challenges um people who are already working we know that workforce challenges are all over the nhs and we just need you um just tell us why and make a good case towards why should we give you the job i'm not going to ask you um why do you want to be a pediatrician um today but this is a homework for you after today is to clarify this for yourself why do you want it and um a few general tips when you answer this question is there are no perfect answers uh, because each of you have different skills, different experience, different expertise that you bring to pediatrics, which is unique to you. And as you wrote your application, I'm sure you realized how much you've done that is relevant to pediatrics as a career and how many skills you've gained so far from all the work that you've done in your medical career, in your pediatrics career, and outside your pediatrics career or medical career altogether. Um, and I know we all find it hard to talk about ourselves, to highlight how good we are at things. And one way um, I found to overcome this um, is to talk about um, kind of your learning journey instead. Talk about um, how what you have done has changed you as a person has changed you as a professional, how it has changed others, how it has changed the system around you. Um, and that also makes your answer much more rounded. It shows you're a person with insight, with a positive attitude to learning and improving all the time. And Salil talked a, a little bit about reflective practice being kind of a learning exercise. And even when you answer the question in the career motivation station, um, incorporate your learning from whatever example you're gonna give um, and, and just show them that you're a person who wants to make a difference to children and families, to the profession of pediatrics. And um, this station is, is just your chance to show the panel why you're suited for a career in pediatrics. Um, but what, what do you bring which will make our specialty even better? Um, you've done voluntary work, for example, that's great. That gave you, gave you lots of skills that are transferable to working in pediatrics. You've worked in pediatrics in three different healthcare systems like me, and some of you even more than that, over 20 years. Wow, that, that's absolutely amazing. Um, you know, you've, you've had experience of, of such a wide and kind of a mature perspective on healthcare systems, on care being delivered in um, high and low income settings and gives you an appreciation for the NHS, I think, um, which is a free at the point of access model that obviously you want to contribute to because you want to come and work here. And that um, is different for each of you, um, that kind of reflective journey. Um, and here are some examples of reasons why I love pediatrics. Um, you will have your, your own. Um, we absolutely have the best patients. They're fun, they're engaging, they're unpredictable, they're honest. Um, they can get unwell quickly, but majority of children get well quickly too. Um, I remember a four-year-old with an acute exacerbation of asthma I saw in any resource in Calderdale actually, where Salil is working right at the minute. Um, and I gave them you know, all the necessary treatments to stabilize them as per the local guideline. We blew some bubbles in resource to relax this kid. Um, I continue to review them throughout the night, um, adjusting bronchodilators, worrying about them, um, and so on. And the next morning, after handover, I find them in the playroom, happy, smiling, still wheezing a bit, but looking much better. And that is where, obviously, I drew my job satisfaction from for that, for that shift. You know, kids are great. And if you say something about that, and then you give an example like I just I just gave you, it kind of makes, puts things into perspective and it shows that this is personal to you and this is your own experience. Uh, you're not talking general stuff only. Um, in pediatrics, you could go from looking after an extremely preterm baby on the neonatal unit to seeing a toddler running around making his wheeze worse like this little boy was doing. 
uh, to an adolescent going through a mental health crisis, presenting to any, to a child with complex physical neurodevelopmental needs and the rare genetic syndrome, to the sweetest five-year-old who told me everything about his presentation with the UTI when he came for a viewing clinic. Um, and no day is the same. Children surprise us all the time. They don't read the textbooks and it's probably a great thing that they don't because they're so much fun. Um, the variety in a career in pediatrics might be the selling point for you. You can remain a generalist in pediatrics or become a specialist in one of the many subspecialties available in the UK. Um, and on that note, I should highlight that community pediatrics is the absolute best subspecialty. And if you want to know more about it, get in touch. <laughs> Um, if you're joining pediatrics because you have an interest in one of the subspecialties, say you want to become a pediatric neurologist, then it shows you're focused, you have done your research on pathways to that career aim, you're putting all the necessary effort and time to get there. You still need to be a good general pediatrician to be a good neurologist, and there are lots of generic skills which will help you on that career path. Um, and we, we all like to see that. And we, we like to see reflective clinicians who have a plan and who are kind of focused to achieve it. So um, I would say if that is your ultimate career aim, mention it, but put it in a broader context of joining a general pathway in pediatric training with a view to subspecialize at some point um, when you've, you've gained enough general skills. Um, if you're interested in practical skills, um, and have an experience in inserting cannulas, intubating newborns, have had some feedback from seniors that you've developed your skills to a point where you work independently or even teach others, um, or you're the go-to person when a difficult case comes, then you can say this and give an example um, and say that you want to develop this further for the benefit of your patients because cannulation is stressful for children and their parents and you want to make this as easy as possible for them. Um, part of that, of that process is skill, and you're on, on, you've developed your skill throughout this career, uh, your career, but um, also part of it is considering the environment. What help do you have? Is there a place specialist to distract the child? And I know some of you who have not worked in the UK, you may not have had place specialists. I know I didn't have them in Romania, for example. Um, uh, they come and distract the child with bubbles, with books, with all sorts of, with an iPad more nowadays, um, all sorts of activities that take their mind away from you putting a cannula. Um, and have you thought about local an analgesia, you know, so on. Um, and you can start with the talking about the skill, how you've grown your expertise in this type of skill, but also how much focused you are on making it a good experience with all the other kind of considering all the other factors that I talked about. And that really gives a richer answer from someone who is mature and thinking about the whole situation and the whole process and your own learning. Um, if you want to be a pediatrician because you have been inspired by some amazing pediatricians you've worked with um, that made an impression on you, then you can construct your answer around this. Say that you've been inspired by them and also describe what was it that made them a good pediatrician? Kindness, communication skills, supportive to others, excellent clinical knowledge um, are some things that are mentioned quite often. And then bring the answer back to you. This is who I want to be in my future career. This is who I aspire to be. This is where I'm growing in these areas I'm growing. My, my expertise and my experience. Um, you're never alone in pediatrics. You're working as part of a team. Um, so having good interpersonal skills is, is kind of required. Um, there is always someone to ask, someone to help you. And we work with people with a wealth of expertise in the wider team. You don't have to think only about the doctors you're working with. Think about nurses, speech therapists, physiotherapists, pediatric pharmacists, play specialists, as I said, advanced nurse practitioners. We have a role in the UK and all the other people in the team um, that we are so fortunate to work with um, and help, uh, who help us look after uh, children and families. And when we face more challenging situations, um, that is when the team comes together even more, in my experience, 
we're supporting each other, we're learning from all of our experiences, good or bad, um, with a view to improve what we do in the future. And don't shy away from saying, there might be a question talking about what's difficult in pediatrics or um, tell us about a different difficult experience you've had and how you've learned from it or something like that. Don't shy away from saying that, you know, some aspects of our work are challenging, um, acutely unwell children, everyone's stressed, parents are stressed, child is stressed, you know, everyone. End of life care um, will be difficult, difficult communication that we have all the time. Um, as I said, upset parents. Um, parents are upset for a reason. I think if we explain our rationale, if we understand why they're upset and address those, um, if we kind of reassure them that we know what we're doing and why, and explain why we're doing the things that we're doing. And generally they're, they're okay. They're just, they're upset because they're stressed. Um, and, um, you know, child protection, I do a lot of child protection. Um, and some of you who have not worked in the UK, maybe that is certainly for me, it wasn't an area I was very, um, uh, I wasn't exposed to that very much in my, outside of UK kind of pediatric practice. Um, and these are kind of the commonest examples of difficult situations that, that um, come to my mind. Um, but you can, when you talk about those, you can say, you know, I know these exist, I'm prepared, have the right skills to give patients and families the best possible experience, even of something very stressful and occasionally sad. Um, Another thing that might be uh, maybe good to say is that UK pediatrics is well ahead of other specialties in terms of team working, looking after each other, looking after our, our trainees. Um, uh, the Royal College of Pediatrics um, is the, one of the first colleges that allows less than full-time working without a necessarily a medical reason or a caring reason, because we know that people work really hard. And if they want to train less than full time, they are free to do that and we're actually encouraged to do that. Um, I'm also drawn into pediatrics and community pediatrics in particular, because we have the unique opportunity to be part of a child's journey throughout their childhood. And we can establish long-term relationships with children and families, um, help them achieve their potential. And we can make a positive long-term impact on someone's life. And that is kind of where I draw my answers from why do I want to be um, a pediatrician. Um, a few examples of types of questions that might come up in this station, apart from why pediatrics or a variation on that topic um, that we've covered. Um, remember, this needs to be a personal answer, which is unique to you. Um, and make the panel want to listen to you, want to hear more about you. and, and, and at the end of this, make them want to work with you. Um, there's the question uh, or the types of questions, tell us about yourself or talk us through your CV. And a lot of people, myself included, um, find it hard to summarize their CV, their career so far, especially if you've done so much. Um, I think it's, it's really hard to summarize that in a two minute answer. Um, the panel for this doesn't really want a list of your previous jobs or you know a list of your all the sections in your CV or anything like that. They want to see your journey, kind of a summary of your experience that is relevant to a job in pediatrics. Um, and I would include in the summary a few kind of key points. Clinical experience would be one of them, um, meaning I'm very competent. I've done so many years of pediatrics across so many settings in acute or outpatients, in uh, general pediatrics, neonatal medicine, um, managing common pediatric presentations independently, seeking senior support appropriately. So kind of summarize your clinical experience rather than list um, what jobs you have done. Um, then another area when you answer this question is probably think, talk about quality improvement um, and, and quality improvement might be a new kind of uh, topic for some of you who have not worked in the UK. Again, it was certainly something new to me, um, but it's about quality improvement thinking and you've all done projects 
that have improved you, improved patient care, improved the department. Um, you've all done something or a few things. Some of you have done quite a lot in, in that, but you didn't really label it as quality improvement. Um, and, and that shows, you know, you're continuously reflecting on your practice, the practice of your team, um, and with a view to improve practice based on latest published evidence, because that's that's what is quality improvement and audit and that kind of work. Um, you can talk about keeping yourself up to date with evidence for practice, uh, kind of regular attendances at peer review sessions or departmental teaching or anything like that. Um, research skills you can you can list here, and this. Um, doesn't necessarily include just completing a, an MD or a PhD, although I know a lot of our international medical graduates have done those things, but um, includes critical appraisal skills, just knowing how to interpret research um, publications and, and knowing how that applies to your practice. Um, teaching skills is another one. I think it's, um, we all teach uh, clinically, in our kind of day-to-day -day work. We teach medical students, we teach junior colleagues, um, we, we, we do some form of clinical teaching very often. And some teach a bit more formally, uh, some may have had um, teaching kind of roles, um, wider roles. Um, managerial skills, if you have any, if you, you know, people have put together this group, um, have done, amazing work and have impacted so many people, so many doctors um, coming to work in the UK and outside of the UK. Um, actually, I was looking at a promotional video for the association and um, you talk about your impact in uh, your home country and all of these things. And it's just amazing. If you've done anything like that, um, definitely you would include that in your answer for this. Tell us about your experience. If you've done voluntary work, you know, how that um, you include that. And I would suggest you prepare kind of a two minute answer for this. It's really hard to summarize it on the spot, I think. And then when you write this kind of two minute answer, highlight about three or four areas um, that you wanna talk a little about um, to give this answer kind of a good framework, a bit of a structure. Um, because as I said, the risk is that you list your jobs and kind of waffle on without making your answer memorable to the panel or specific enough for them to be able to score you well. Um, there's another type of question. What are the characteristics of a good pediatrician and how do you fit those? It's a, you know, it's a combination. If you think about the type of answer that is requ that requires, it's a combination of why do you want this? Why do you think you're good for it? Um, and they just want to know your skills kind of that fit pediatrics. Um, you may want to talk about ability to apply holistic care to children, um, which really means that we see the entire child, we see them in the wider context of their family, their school, their community, we help them achieve their potential and get them well to go back out and, and um, out of hospital if you're thinking from the acute side of uh, pediatrics and uh, enjoying life. Um, the Royal College of Pediatrics has an entire web page on choose pediatrics. I'm, I'm, I have it on a different, on the next slide. And I would encourage you to just read this if you haven't done it already. It gives you inspiration for this answer. Um, but, but please choose things that, um, so that, that page includes uh, a few children interviewing clinicians, which I thought was really nice and fun. Um, it includes um, people's reflections on why they like a career in pediatrics, why, they, why they've pursued this. Um, and it kind of, some of those will ring true to you and you'll think, yeah, that's probably why I like it too. Um, some might not, just as I said, choose, um, the ones that fit you. Otherwise, um, you risk answering in a very artificial kind of learned way, and the panel will pick up on that. Um, I think if I was in the panel, I just want to see who you are. Um, and then another one that is kind of tricky is to think about what are you most proud of in your career or in your life? 
Um, and what is your biggest achievement? Again, it comes back to, we don't really wanna talk about ourselves as much, but this is a chance for you to show kind of your potential to make pediatrics even greater. Um, it's a question also about your view on the world, your kind of personality, what previous experiences and interests do you bring to us? Um, and don't think only clinical, professional, academic achievements, because that's, that's what we think first, uh, don't we? Think wider and think impact on others, how um, kind of you're proud because what you've done made a difference. What was that difference? And, and talk about that a little bit more. And as a first generation kind of migrant myself, I know we all have a tendency to think small and annoying voices like, what do I bring? Nothing, I'm, I'm a simple person. Uh, they, these come to me all the time. Some days I feel like an imposter as well, and I'm sure some of you will relate to that. Just stop that voice because it's wrong. The mere fact that you've left your home country, traveled the world, adapted to a new culture, a new language. Some of you learned a new alphabet, um, a new healthcare system. All of these are exceptional things and show that how adaptable you are, how open you are, your kind of um, survival skills, but also thriving skills um, through maybe some, some difficult different times. And the sooner you realize this, the better for you. <laughs> um, just think when you answer some of these questions think bigger think anything that you have done which has made a difference to other people all of you have done some, a, a lot of things like that um, one that people are a bit afraid of maybe is what is your biggest weakness um, and I think I would, I would challenge you and, and this is I suppose you know this is something that comes to mind easier you're thinking oh I don't know enough, um, I've not done enough, or I am i don't know if I'm a good enough doctor. All of these things come to you, some of you regularly, um, but think when you answer this question, think about something that you've learned from uh, or something that you are working on. Um, they want to see not just the weakness, uh, but want to see again, insight, how you thought about this weakness. What have you done about it? What is your plan? to overcome this weakness? And how did you put this into practice? Um, I mean, I can give you an example. I find it quite hard to say no. I get excited about all sorts of things uh, that seem like a great idea all the time. Um, so sometimes I take too many projects, too much kind of on because, because I'm, I find it hard to say no. Um, another one would be, I find it hard to stop, take breaks. Um, especially when the ward or the assessment unit is very busy and you know workload is piling up. But then once you you can you can say that's your your biggest weakness. But then you can say I realize that by taking breaks my performance actually improves, and I have been reading published evidence which supports regular breaks for healthcare professionals doing shift work. Um, and by reading this latest published evidence. I realized that by taking breaks, I'm not only looking after myself, but in fact, I'm looking after my patients by making sure I perform at my best when I see them. So you've turned your weakness, which is a weakness, we all need to stop <laughs> as often as it's okay to stop and we need to, um, but you've turned that into, I know it's a problem. I'm, I've actually researched it quite a bit and I think uh, there's enough evidence to tell me that I should be doing it, this not for me necessarily, but for my patients. And I'm now implementing it into my day-to-day -day practice. So yeah, think, think um, about something specific to you again. Um, and then I, a very good resource, as I said, is this Choose Pediatrics from the Royal College uh, of Pediatrics. If you're not members of the Royal College, um, I would suggest you become members. They have all sorts of really good resources on there. And even if you're not a member, you can still access all sorts of information and all sorts of resources that are open. And, um, and doing that bit of research, understanding how the Royal College of Pediatrics talks about pediatrics in the UK, what sort of 
kind of a new developments, what sort of new themes um, come up in their web page, in their discussions, things like tackling inequalities in healthcare or um, the topic on quality improvement. There's a whole page on that as well. And all sorts of opportunities for trainees to get involved in the Royal College of Pediatrics kind of um, day to day working. You can put that in your answers as to why you want to join the pediatric training program in the UK because it's a place of um, uh, with a lot of opportunities to develop skills and a lot of opportunities to impact care or, um, that we deliver to children and young people, um, either locally, regionally, nationally. Um, and don't, I, it took me some time to come out of my small mind thinking, don't, um, don't stay there just um, put yourself forward for things. And that's how, you know, all of the things that um, were mentioned at the beginning, I'm part of this and part of this and part of the other. Some of it is because I, I find it hard to say no to really good ideas. But um, another is, I just, you know, even if I didn't think necessarily that I have all the right skills for that, I just put myself forward and it kind of happened. And I grew with that and with that experience. And a good book that I've used to structure my answers for different types of questions is this. Um, it's an A5 type book, Medical Interviews. Um, there's, I think, a few editions. This is one of the front covers. Um, don't, you, don't think that you need to read all of the book or you know, do it like in a very uh, meticulous kind of way. Go through different types of questions. Um, and structure your own personal answers. Um, I'm nearly at the end. I think just good luck, relax as much as possible, because as I said, it will allow you to use as much cortex as possible on the day. Just show the panel you're a good candidate, make them want to work with you. Um, and there are multiple ways to your career aim. Just don't, don't add more pressure onto yourself. And I, let me open, let me stop sharing this and open the chat because I can see some comments. Anyone wants to ask me questions directly? I'm very happy. Hi, Gerald. It's so nice to see some people I'm working with or I have. I have Hi, Monica. <laughs> yes, um, just allow yourself to be who you are and, what, and, and think what you bring to the table. Um, as you've demonstrated in that, uh, when I asked you to tell me how long, where you've worked and, and how, how long you've worked for, it's just, it's just amazing. Even if you haven't worked in pediatrics, all of those skills, as I said, are really valuable. And we want people with different experiences from different places, absolutely. Thank Sorry, you, Monica. I, that was I, I a do very... chat too much. No, no, not at all. It was, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much, it was, it was really good. I can't see any questions. No, a um, lot of thank yous. I'm really happy it was useful, but ask me some questions. I'm sure you have questions. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much for this talk. It was useful, especially mm -hmm. for us as IMG doctors working in the yes. NHS, feeling little in a big organization. That's Absolutely. very encouraging from you. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Rada. Absolutely. I just, you know, we we don't allow ourselves yeah to, to just dream and and do things that we want to do yeah it is a problem yes it is a problem but there are ways of working through that just just look through your application your application has captured a lot of things that you've already done and if you go through that you you will use your application when you do your prep or interview isn't it because that summarizes in different areas of your experience things that you've done um, and include those when you give all of the answers in, in the career motivation part and in others, other sections, include examples from your uh, practice, from your experience in other things. Okay. I think I'm, I'm, I've done it shorter than planned, but um, I hope 
I gave you permission to just relax. I enjoyed my interviews. I think it's a, it's a nice chance to speak to some people who are pediatricians. Some of them you might have come across if you've already worked here, or you might have listened to them talking at, at some uh, event or whatever. And you, some of them might be people you even look up to. Uh, isn't that amazing that you can have a chat with them in the interview? It's a chat interview. But I know it will be a little bit stressful. I know. We all, we can't. We can't prevent that. Try and as much as possible dampen that down a little bit. And if you want to talk to me or ask me more questions or anything like that, I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, especially community pediatrics, but anything. Yeah. Out of interest, how many people know community pediatrics? Raise your hand if you've heard or have seen community pediatrics, just because I'm curious. Okay, a few. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Yes, thank you. Yes, we exist. Come and see what we do. Yes. Monica, I think somebody wants to know the name of the book that you recommended. The name of the book, I'll, well, I didn't have a link. Let me find this book again and I'll put a link to a page for it. <clears throat> it's Medical Interviews, a comprehensive. So Amazon, for example, I should share with you. We've got a couple of raised hands from Monica. Arjun, yes. Special day of my dreams. Hi, hi, friend. So that is a, a link to the. Shall I? Um, you would have done a lot of research, you know, because you've applied to a pediatric training program, isn't it? Um, and it's. It's granted this the most straightforward way into pediatrics and into a career becoming to become a consultant pediatrician. It is a run through program. You can, you know, you go through training and everything happens as long as you follow up all the training requirements. But still, um, there are multiple other ways. I promise. Don't don't pressurize yourself more than you need to. The hands up means that you have questions. Or not? Um, I think those are raised hands for people who know about community peace or community. Are interested in community peace. Yeah, very nice. Okay. I'm not sure when your next talk is it quarter? Quarter two? Your session was the last session for the day. Oh, excellent. Isn't this lovely? <laughs> Absolutely. I've left you with a bit of a fuzzy feeling of you can do this because you can. And as I said, the NHS needs you more than what, how much you need it. I promise. So yeah, welcome everyone. And, and I hope it's working okay for you. Okay, thank you, Monica. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Nuha, one of the academic office. I think we came to the end of our session for today. And on behalf of uh, my colleagues in the academic office and uh, BSAP CH, I would like to thank all our speakers who are volunteering their time to be with us today and to, and to support us as IMDs. And um, thank you everyone here for attending our event today. And hopefully we met your expectation and need, and we will be happy to see you soon in our coming activities. 
And uh, just please feel the feedback form. There is link dropped on the chat box and uh, there is QR code here. You can scan it and just please spare some time to fill this feedback. It is important for both um, our speakers, our lovely speakers. Um, it, it will help them in their e-portfolio and to track their, um, their performance. And also for us in academic office, uh, it just to um, improve our, uh, our activities and to ensure better quality next time. And also on that feedback form, you, we have, you have a chance to suggest um, the coming activity. So please um, just drop uh, some suggestion for us to, um, to include them in our 2023 um, academic office um, um, plans, um, hopefully. Um, also, I'm honored to announce um, our mock interview. So we will, um, we arranged already a mock interview um, a workshop next Saturday on 21st of January. And this will be exclusively for those who um, been accepted for ST1 interview. Um, so the registration will start on 17th of January after the RCBC Edge releasing the shortlisting um, result. So stay tuned and see you there and good luck in your application. Um, if there is no question, I think we will end our session and thank you. Salam alaikum.